Thank you, councillors. Welcome back. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make here today. Amen. Amen. Brisbane City Council acknowledges this country and its traditional custodians. We acknowledge and respect the spiritual relationship between traditional custodians and this country, which has inspired language, songs, dance, law, and dreaming stories over many thousands of years. We pay, res we pay our respects to the elders, those who have passed into the dreaming, those here today, those of tomorrow. May we continue to peacefully walk together in gratitude, respect and kindness in caring for this country and one another. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. As we do at the beginning of all new sessions, I remind all councillors of your obligations to declare prescribed and or declarable conflicts of interests where relevant and the requirement as such to remove yourself from the council chamber for debate and voting where applicable. Are there any apologies? Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I advise that Councillor Marks will be absent today and I move that she be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that Councillor Marks be granted leave of absence from today's meeting. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, motion of condolence, please. <coughs> Uh, thanks, Mr Chair. I move that the City of Brisbane marks with great sadness the loss of life that has occurred in the communities throughout Turkey and Syria. We support every effort being made by the Commonwealth Government to help restore those affected communities. On behalf of the City of Brisbane, we pass on our deepest condolences to those who have lost family members and loved ones in these earthquake tragedies. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by uh, the Lord Mayor and seconded by Councillor Cassidy that the City of Brisbane marks with great sadness the loss of life that has occurred in communities throughout Turkey and Syria. We support every effort being made by the Commonwealth Government to help restore these affected local communities. On behalf of the City of Brisbane, we pass on our deepest condolences to those who have lost family members and loved ones in these earthquake tragedies. Lord Mayor. <coughs> Uh, sorry, sorry. Me. Right. Thank you. Uh, two Mondays ago, at approximately 4 a.m. in the morning, uh, or 11 a.m. Brisbane time, two deadly earthquakes hit the city of Gaziantep in south central Turkey. Uh, these earthquakes registered an incre incredible 7.7 .7 and 7.8 magnitude, which stretched across 10 cities and seven provinces. Given the timing of the earthquake in the middle of the night, most of those who have passed away would have been asleep at the time. This is an absolutely devastating situation and our thoughts are with all members of the Turkey community, both here in Brisbane and abroad, and also the Syrian community. The Deputy Mayor recently met with representatives from both the Turkish and Syrian community in Brisbane last Friday to convey our city's concern for them and also uh, to offer our support and anything that we could do to support them in this time of need. Uh, as we do, we obviously lit up our council assets in a public display of support to one of those who had lost their lives in the earthquake. A condolence book was arranged and placed in the entrance of City Hall for the public to leave messages. There are over 800 Turkish-born Australian citizens within the Brisbane City Council area who are either grieving or worrying about loved ones back home. They're searching for information and they are getting very little information in response. Now, this country and this democracy that we live in is a democracy that values every single life. And we know from our own experience as a city last year when we had the devastating floods, every life that is lost is a tragedy and one that is important. And so in that context, to think about you know, what we went through last year with the flood, but then to think of a death toll of 33,000 lives so far. 33,000 is incomprehensible. Each one of those lives important. Each one of those lives, a son or a daughter, a brother or sister, a mother or a father, 
a grandparent, a loved one. And most importantly, the challenge of not knowing the Turkish community in Australia, the Syrian community in Australia, not knowing what has happened to their loved ones. And that is the biggest challenge right now, not knowing, not having access to that information. So many of those lives that are lost were buried underneath mountains of rubble. And in fact, there were 8,400 buildings which have already collapsed or needed to be demolished. 8,400 buildings. Over 100,000 people have been displaced, their homes destroyed. And so these kind of figures are, as I said, incomprehensible. And so we, here in the city of Brisbane, want the people of Turkey and Syria to know that our hearts go out to you. Our hearts are with the local Turkish community, the local Syrian community, but also for those back home. Uh, we are thinking of them. We want to do what we can, both as a city and as a nation, to support them. I understand the federal government was quick to act, pledging $10 million in aid to the affected governments and I, uh, to the affected areas, and I congratulate the government for that quick response. This aid will be provided through our partners on the ground, like Red Cross, Red Crescent, the United Nations Children's Fund, to focus on immediate needs like shelter, clean water and sanitation. Australia is also sending a rescue team of 72 people to help with the recovery. And with the federal government doing its bit, and with us being the largest council in Australia, I think it's appropriate that we do more than just offer our words of support and our thoughts and prayers, but that we also offer some practical support as well. And so yesterday, uh, Civic Cabinet decided that on behalf of the City of Brisbane, we would be donating $25,000 to UNICEF to support uh, the relief efforts. Uh, we have heard very clearly that while people want to send things over to support, that right now it is money that is the much needed thing. Uh, it is difficult at the moment to get any goods or supplies into those countries. And in fact, many of the airports are out of action. The roads are out of action. There's no way of getting supplies in. So right now, funding is the critical need. And so on behalf of the people of Brisbane, uh, we would like to provide this donation on behalf of everyone in this chamber. We would like to provide that support and also encourage uh, people in the Brisbane community that are concerned to also uh, consider giving and supporting those relief efforts. As I said, our hearts go out for the tragic loss of life, the unthinkable tragedy that's happened, and our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Turkey and Syria at this time. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, I rise to second this motion and on behalf of uh, our team in Council and the community we represent, extend our deepest condolences to those who have been affected by these earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, as well as the Turkish and Syrian communities here in Brisbane who are no doubt hurting too. We know there are thousands of people originally from Syria and Turkey Air who call Brisbane home now, and there's a significant Syrian um, community very close to my ward over in Brackenridge as well, and I know they will be um, hurting at the moment. Uh, Brisbane is, of course, a city that is no stranger to natural disasters, but we are very fortunate to have never seen anything on the scale of this tragedy. More than 35,000 people now have died across Turkey Air and Syria following those two devastating earthquakes and numerous aftershocks that have hit the region uh, since February 6th. The earthquakes have also caused widespread damage to schools and other essential infrastructure, further jeopardising the well-being of children and families. Access to safe water and sanitation is also a major concern, as are the health needs of the affected populations. Uh, up to seven million children are now displaced in that region. The most important thing uh, an organisation like the Brisbane City Council can do in a time like this is provide financial support, and I'm glad to hear uh, that Brisbane will be <coughs> offering um, that $25,000 contribution. Uh, and as this disaster continues to unfold and the needs of uh, those many millions of people um, uh, need to be met over the coming months and years, I certainly hope we will keep an eye on that uh, and adjust that support as needed as well. 
Uh, the people affected in Syria and Turkey are in desperate need of clean drinking water, food, emergency shelter and medicine. So I would echo the words of the Lord Mayor. The best thing that we can do is offer financial support rather than um, collecting things uh, and trying to provide them in a, uh, their desperate need of our at the moment. UNICEF has estimated that on top of that rising death toll, as I mentioned, seven million children and families have been affected. Many of those families have lost their homes and are now living in temporary shelters, often in freezing conditions with snow and rain adding to their suffering. Uh, it is unimaginable for people like us sitting in this chamber right now uh, to try and picture what those people are going through. Uh, so once again, we'd like to send our deepest condolences to those affected by this tragedy, uh, thank the Lord Mayor and Council for the financial contribution uh, and encourage people right around Brisbane to dig deep for these people in their time of need. Thank you. Any further speakers? No further speakers? Oh, sorry. Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, just briefly, <clears throat> I'd like to add um, uh, my support to the motion before us today uh, and to um, just uh, let people know that uh, the City of Brisbane obviously is uh, very aware of the impact of this natural disaster. Unfortunately, our country has seen um, so many natural disasters over the years <clears throat> and the loss of life that uh, has been experienced here is far beyond anything that we've seen um, in Brisbane in recent years. I do feel, however, um, that the Lord Mayor's response today is completely inadequate. Um, I suspect his recent trip to the US cost more than um, the $25,000 that he's putting in, and I just don't think that's appropriate. So if we're going to help, we should do it properly, we should do it practically, um, and we should be able to make a real difference to the people who are suffering um, in this part of the world. Any further speakers? Lord Mayor. I now put the motion. All in favour of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Uh, may I have confirmation of minutes, please? Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,699th meeting held on Tuesday, the 6th of December 20, 2022, be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the minutes of the 4,699th meeting of Council held on 6 December 2022 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, we have a public participant here this morning, uh, Mrs Lynn Wright. Sorry, my apologies, Mrs Lynn White, who wants to address the Chamber on the resumption of land at 316 Priestdale Road, Rochdale. Mrs White, please, uh, Billy is showing you to the, the position. Thank you. Mrs White, uh, you have five minutes and a Civic Cabinet Chair will respond. Thank you. Mr Chair, Lord Mayor and Councillors, my name is Lynn White and I'm here today as a matter concerning the resumption of 8.6 metres deep or 215 square metres of our front yard is being put before you for resumption approval. Our front yard is an integral part of our family life and our grandchildren's play area. We will virtually be left sitting on the road with no front yard and we have no backyard. It is important to note that the basis of our land resumption in the notice to resume was not for the purpose of four lane road widening, but for the purposes of the Gardner Road to Underwood Road extension project. What is very important for you to know today is that City Projects Office provided a second set of design drawings to us after the objection period. We have not been provided with the opportunity to properly respond to and assess this second drawing as part of our objection process and have it reviewed by an independent resumption delegate, thereby denying us as objectors of our rights in this process. We believe city projects have not included this important information in the information they have put before the Establishment and Coordination Committee and full council. Further, I requested city projects office that a very important letter outlining the legal reasons why the resumption is legally wrong also be put before members of the Establishment Committee and full council prior to today's session and was told by city projects office this was not possible also. 
It is important to note that comments made by Pretty City Projects Office in a series of letter exchanges illustrate a reason other than that noted in the notice of intention to resume our land and demonstrates the legal incorrectness of this resumption, rendering the notice to resume intention to resume we believe to be legally invalid. Council does not require all of our land for the Gardner Road to Underwood Road extension project. As for the second drawings, it would appear Council is leaving what appears to be a massive grass verge of approximately eight metres to the immediate west of our property and proposing to resume 8.6 metres off our front yard to just sit there for the next 20 years or so in case, just in case, Priestow Road is ever widened to four lanes thereby depriving us and our family of our enjoyment of it. Please note the inconsistency that it was shown in Council's own traffic flow statistics and information that Priestdale Road is neither earmarked for four lanes and does not warrant four lanes based on traffic flow information, either in the short or long term. This makes absolutely no sense at all. We question whether City Projects have ever really sat down together with the design team, looked at the designs, looked at other options and asked the question, do we really need to be resuming 8.6 metres of the White's front yard for the extension of the Gardner Road to Underwood Road project? Because if they did, they would determine that there are other options that could reduce the resumption of land off our property with a view to minimising the impact of a resumption on a resident, as stated in Council's own documentation attached with the notice to resume. I have not experienced this whatsoever in this whole entire process and my experience with city projects to date. We have observed where other councils have actually built roads around trees. We are living, breathing human beings, we have a family, the front yard is our recreational area and where our grandchildren play, and we are not being given the compromise and courtesy of reducing our resumption to only what is required if anything at all, for this Gardner Road to Underwood Road extension, the basis of the resumption. There are other design options available to minimise the impact of this resumption on our property and our family. Council needs to be looking at these other options further. At no time has City Projects discussed any form of compromise with us for other options, the response of being constantly a negative narrative. The project appears rushed. There are a lot of questions, inconsistencies, discussions, more clarity and due diligence required surrounding the Gardner Road to Underwood Road project, and the main question being more consideration of the amount of land, if any, that is required to be resumed from our property for this project. A City Projects officer first knocked on our door and he advised, Council intends to resume a couple of metres of your land. We were shocked to receive the notice of intention to room stated council wants more than 8.6 metres deep of our front yard, a considerable difference to just a couple of metres. We do not want council city projects office to make a huge mistake, which we know and believe they are making with the resumption of 8.6 metres of our land. It is for these reasons we ask that the decision concerning the resumption of land from our property be put on hold at this stage by full council until more diligence, clearer designs, consistency of information and some compromise is made regarding the resumption of our entire front yard and our property and until such time as full, complete and correct information is put before the Establishment and Coordination Committee and, and the full council. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mrs White. Your time has expired. City Cabinet Chair to respond. Councillor Wines. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Mrs White, for taking the time to come and speak with us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Wines. I'm the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, and I, will ha I have carriage of the Gardner Road uh, projects. Um, can I uh, also acknowledge uh, Councillor Huang and his personal advocacy on your behalf as well? Uh, as you can appreciate, the part of the city where you live is a growing part of the city with increasing population, both on our side of the boundary and on the Logan side of the boundary. To maintain and to properly service that growth in population, we do have to maintain and improve the infrastructure in that part of our city. I would imagine that you are familiar with the recent works of the, uh, the Priestdale and Rochdale intersection, which were recently completed. They wouldn't be far from your home, but further information was provided to committee this morning on that particular intersection. And also, the uh, Rochdale area is also a principal uh, part of our uh, metro works with the housing of the depot in that community as well. Because of the changes required uh, from the Metro, we are required to upgrade the road network in the Rochdale area. 
there are a number of projects proposed which include the Gardner Road extension, which is the project that concerns your property, but also other projects, as I've discussed, such as that Rochdale Priest Island section. Can I say that uh, I find resumption of private property a deeply unpleasant uh, an uncomfortable part of road construction. It's not something that I enjoy. I don't think that any of us enjoy it, but it is at times something that is necessary to ensure that we achieve the outcome for the greater community. Uh, the Gardner extension, it's, a, it's important uh, infrastructure investment, which is much needed for the future of that area. Um, and we expect that upon completion, it will carry roughly 14,000 vehicles per day. Uh, in, whether in com a completion or nearly uh, after the, the road corridor has been concluded. There, have been a, there was a number of concerning comments you made in your presentation, and I'd be keen to see the paperwork around those. Uh, I have uh, discussed with our officers the, the, the process around the NIR, the, the Notice of Intention to Resume, and the land uh, resumption process. The process proposed for your property is consistent with all other uh, processes for other resumptions that we have undertaken. Uh, and I would like to see the paperwork you have, but at this point I have not seen an inconsistency internally. But again, your paperwork may indicate something that I am not aware of. The, uh, there were some other issues that were raised um, outside of, of the presentation today, but the Council does possess the power to resume for the purposes of transport, which includes bikeways. And I think that that at some points has been a point of contention. So the project does include four laning, the project does include a verge and does include bikeways and some parking facilities. Uh, the carriageway, which includes all forms of transport, is uh, considered or it is contemplated within the Acquisitions Act. So uh, there are some uh, important points. Please pass on all your paperwork. The Gardner Road extension is a key part of our uh, program for the southeast of the city. Please accept my um, sincere empathy at the situation you find yourself in. I, as I say, said earlier, I take no pleasure in, in resuming land for road, but this is a very important project and one we will consider uh, more fully later this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Point Lund. of order, Chair. Yeah. Uh, point of order to you, Councillor Three Ring and other. Yeah, I'd like to move suspension of so much of standing orders as is necessary to move an urgency motion regarding the Priestdale Road to Underwood Road project. You want to second? Seconded. Councillor Three Ring and other, you have up to three minutes to establish why you weren't able to move this onto the notice paper earlier. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I've, I've just heard the comments from Mrs White and I, I'm very concerned to hear about the process that's um, gone on so far regarding this proposed resumption. I, I don't see a need to proceed with this um, matter today and I would like to see the um, decision made in terms of item D on the Establishment and Coordination Committee report uh, delayed to a later date. So uh, I, I think there's a very strong case for taking a bit more time here. I think the resident has rightly requested a bit more information and I think there's um, certainly some serious questions about whether the property or the portion of the property is actually needed. Um, personally, I'm strongly opposed to the widening of Priestdale Road. I don't think it needs, um, needs to be widened and I don't think this uh, eight, eight metre stretch of land is necessary uh, to complete the, the project as described. So I'd, I'd yeah, like to suggest and, and move that we uh, delay a decision on item D today and that we require the city projects team to go back and consult further with Ms White and other affected residents before any decisions are made about the resumption. And to the question of urgency, I've only become aware of this issue upon reading the uh, papers that were submitted over the last 24 hours or so. And I think having heard Ms White today, I, I would like more time and I would like the council to consider this more deeply before making such a big decision that's going to have a fundamental impact on this family and their property. The motion before us is for the suspension of standing rules to allow the uh, to allow Councillor Sri Ranganathan to move a motion. All in favour of the suspension of standing rules, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division being called by Councillor Sri Ranganathan and Councillor Cook. Eyes to the right, nose to the left, please.
with them. Thank you, clerks. Please close the bars. Results, please. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 19 against. Thank you. That motion is not carried. Councillors, please, please resume your seats as quickly as possible. Point of order, Question. Chair. Point sorry, of order. sorry, just one more. Uh, it's not a big deal, um, but I just wanted to draw your attention to a matter of good order in the chamber. As councillors were moving back and forth here, I'm not going to name the councillor, but one of them muttered the term disgraceful as we were walking past. And I, I, I assume the implication was that the move, moving of that urgency motion was a disgraceful thing to do. And I take Point of order. With, Point of order. Point of order. That was me, and I was talking to Councillor Wines about the Super Bowl yesterday. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can, can, can we move on, please? Question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a Civic Cabinet Chair of any of the standing committees? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, with 2023 now well underway, can you outline to the Chamber some of the priorities for the Schrinner Council um, that will be focused on delivering for the people of Brisbane? Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Uh, and I know that uh, you are passionate about the future of this city, as is every person on this side of the Chamber. Uh, 2023 is the year of building. It is the year that Council has funded more capital works, building more building of capital works than any year in the city's history. Over a billion dollars worth of work funded uh, to be spread right across the city. And in fact, 80% of all Council's budget goes to the suburbs. And in fact, it is 86% to be precise. And so we are in the year of building a better Brisbane. And whether that includes some of the major projects that people have heard about or the raft of suburban improvements that are going on. Uh, we are building a better Victoria Park with the new master plan being finalised in that process, a new pump track uh, at, at uh, Victoria Park and park embellishments, uh, the supporting and investment in events in Victoria Park to activate Brisbane's biggest new park in 50 years. Uh, whether it's the Brisbane Metro with tunnelling underway uh, now, proceeding very soon past this building uh, under the surface, uh, whether it's the construction of the Metro Depot out of Rochdale, which is well underway, or whether it's the continued testing of the Metro vehicle, uh, Brisbane Metro powers or charges full steam ahead. The Green Bridge, Bridge projects are underway at Breakfast Creek and Kangaroo Point. Uh, the Mogul Road corridor upgrade is underway in the western suburbs in that most dangerous and congested of western suburbs uh, roads and, and the uh, work is going on in a whole range of suburban upgrades and road improvements. Uh, whether it's Ritchie Road upgrade in Pallara, investing in one of the fastest growing parts of Brisbane or whether it's the Gardner Road extension, investing in another fastest growing part of Brisbane, uh, we are investing in building a better Brisbane and more infrastructure for a growing city. And whether it's the $22 million investment in the Archerfield Wetland Program, a wonderful park upgrade which will see a former sewage treatment plant converted into an amazing parkland uh, for the people of Brisbane and particularly the people of the south side. Or whether it's the Bradbury Park upgrade which is going to be a truly spectacular one-of-a-kind playground that I think people will come not only from all around Brisbane to see but even further afield than that as well. Uh, whether it's the Murray Recreation Reserve, International Cycle and Speed Skating Track, the new Everton Park Library, where we turned the sod just the other day, Councillor Davis, the Zilmere li Library upgrade, the Sunsafe Suburban Playgrounds Initiative, which will see at least 50 playgrounds upgraded with shade uh, just this year alone. Or whether it's our plans to create more homes for people, the Bridgman Downs Neighbourhood Plan, 
uh, which will create approximately 4,000 new homes. Our suburban renewal and precinct planning initiatives, which will create thousands of new homes across the city and opportunity for more. Whether it's our Pathways Out of Homelessness program, which, will, which is now open and will support the great organisations doing amazing things, not only to provide an immediate response to, to homelessness, but to help people get out of that situation and get their life back on track, get their life back to normal uh, and have a secure roof over their head. We'll soon be releasing our new housing strategy. Uh, and I know Councillor Allen is very excited about that. And there will be opportunities to provide more supply of housing in Brisbane to help with the affordability challenges to help with the housing shortage, uh, we are focused on building a better Brisbane. And whether it's roads, public transport, whether it's parks and playgrounds, whether it is new homes for people, this is a year of building and this is a year I'm incredibly excited about. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Cook. Thank you. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, today is Valentine's Day, so I wanted to ask you about a relationship of yours that has clearly gone sour. Former LNP councillor Kate Richards has launched legal action against members of the LNP and you personally. Court documents allege some very disturbing things occurred before she was cut by your party and about the way city planning decisions are made in Brisbane. One of the allegations reads... Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Owen. Uh, Mr Chair, I refer you to the lo locals' laws for the meeting and in respect of questions they are meant to be asked without statement, argument or um, placing a position. Could you please rule on the question? Thank you. Councillor Cook, I um, assume you're going to round up to a question very shortly. Thank you, Mr Chair. One of the allegations reads like extortion to the tune of $200,000 in campaign funds being withheld from the LNP. Lord Mayor, were you a willing participant in the removal of Kate Richards as an LNP councillor or were you forced into it via threats as suggested in media reports? Lord Mayor. I can simply say I don't comment on fairy tales, uh, and this is exactly what we see here. Um, if Councillor Cook is genuinely interested, she would have read the rest of the article where the LNP's response was made clear. That response is my position, and I won't be adding any further to that. Further questions? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Transport Committee, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, one of the Sri Lanka Council's signature projects, the Brisbane Metro, has made significant progress over the break, with plenty more to come this year. Could you please update councillors on the latest in this turn up and go public transport project? Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr Chair, and through you to Councillor Huang for the question. Because I know Councillor Huang has a keen interest in the Metro project, with the construction of the depot well underway now in his ward at Rochdale. That depot will be Australia's biggest electric bus depot once finished, Mr Chair, but it's only one of ten construction sites that we now have open across the city. The Adelaide Street Tunnel is another key piece of infrastructure in our metro project which will transform our city's bus network and help reduce congestion in the public transport system. Councillors will note that the tunnel it, uh, we'll be passing right below our feet in the coming months, which is slightly nerve-wracking, but mostly exciting. The tunnel has two work sites at the portal along North Quay and another at the northern end of the tunnel in King George Square Station, where the tunnel will ultimately connect in with the existing busway. Late last year, we reached a very big milestone with the completion of preparatory works on the tunnel portal. Now, Mr Chair, tunnelling is a very uh, superstitious business, uh, which is why we had both a smoking ceremony and a priest to give a blessing, give us good luck for the work ahead. St Barbara is the patron, uh, patron saint of tunnelling, so there's a statue of her on site for good luck. And so far, I'm glad to see that has worked and the tunnelling is progressing extremely well. And I was very pleased to be able to give a first look at the progress to the media this morning and they were very impressed with just how much progress has already been made since late last year. The tunnel is being excavated in three faces using a purpose-built canopy drill 
uh, rig. We've already mined as far as 20 metres along in some sections. The tunnelling team are tunnelling 24 hours a day, seven days a week, meaning that we're able to cram two and a half years worth of tunnelling in just one year. And that's only possible, Chair, because we've opted for a mined tunnelling methodology rather than a cut and cover solution to minimise the impact that works would have on surrounding residents and businesses as well as the wider transport network. We know, Chair, that this was the right decision because we've seen how cut and cover tunnels have disturbed uh, other cities like Auckland and Sydney. This tunnel, though, is only seven metres below the surface at its deepest, Mr Chair, uh, and there is a complex network of uh, utilities, heritage buildings and other basements that we will pass by closely underground. Just this morning, Chair, we were about five metres from the bottom bar at the Criterion Hotel to give you an example of just how close we will be to some of the city's most important cultural institutions. In fact, uh, our tunnel is the first time in Australia that a soft ground tunnel with low cover will be constructed in a highly built up urban environment. More than 3, uh, 39,500 cubic metres of material will be removed during the construction of this tunnel, which could fill nearly 16 Olympic sized swimming pools. Once complete, the tunnel uh, will be over 200 metres long, providing a dedicated connection between the South East Busway to the Inner Northern Busway, bypassing the congested, uh, congested Queen Street Bus Tunnel. Approximately one third of the city's bus services will be taken off our CBD streets, with, the, uh, with delivering major travel time savings for commuters both on and off buses. Metros and some of our bus services will now be removed from the surface of Adelaide Street and redirected through the tunnel at North Quay. Uh, and what's happening, uh, there's a lot happening, Chair, underneath Adelaide Street, but this week we will start work on the surface of Adelaide Street. So um, people will start to see the upgrade of the walkability of Adelaide Street uh, with the Adelaide Street Transformation Project, where we will declutter the streetscape and improve the usability of the city's bus stops. It's a very important street for our city. And at the moment, it's very difficult to navigate. It is cluttered with street furniture, uh, and it can be hard for visitors to our city to find the right bus stop. And so, Chair, that is all about to change. We will be creating wider footpaths. We'll be building new pedestrian build-outs and crossing points. We'll be building new street furniture and enhancing the landscaping and installing more public art. And we will reduce the streetscape clutter by over 80%. The works will be completed overnight to minimise impacts, but there will be some changes to bus stops during works, particularly if you catch a bus on Adelaide Street in the evening. So from Sunday to Thursday nights, residents catching a bus from Adelaide Street should make sure to check the TransLink website for updates to their bus stop location. Um, both the surface works and tunnelling will continue for the rest of the year, Mr Chair, before we link the new tunnel in with the existing busway at King George Square Station. There's a lot of work to do before Metro services commence next year, Chair, but we are well and truly on the way to delivering the most complex project this Council has ever undertaken, a $1.7 billion transformation of our city public Council transport Murphy, network, the network that moves two-thirds of our commuters. Further questions. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, while you were on your North American holiday, I'm sure you caught up with Councillor Fiona Hammond's uh, interesting interview on 4VC, where she referred to a genuine local community campaign, including a petition signed by over 900 people to save the Stafford Bowls Club as, and I quote, porkies and mistruths. Uh, this is the usual LNP response, of course, when anyone in Brisbane dares to challenge your decisions. To your question, Councillor Cassidy. Lord Mayor, will you apologise to Stafford locals and how will Councillor Hammond be reprimanded? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question. Councillor Hammond is a local champion and that's why she keeps getting elected year in, year out uh, by what would normally be a Labor ward. Um, and she is a champion that wants to see what is a derelict, overgrown, disused site reactivated for the community. Uh, we, know, we know that Labor has a history of fake campaigns when it comes to bowls clubs, and this is a corker. This is a corker. Now, we know that there is a whole lot of mistruths going around about this particular one, uh, but let me tell you the facts. Let's have a change. Uh, let's have some facts. So this particular lease 
uh, was originally awarded to the Crushers Leagues Club. That lease went through a competitive process. Uh, Crushers was suggested as the uh, winning tender or bidder. Uh, and they had a proposal to make a significant investment into this site. Their proposal included a significant multi-million dollar investment and this proposal came through to the chamber. What has changed since then? What has changed since then? Well, first of all, at the time when the Crushers Leagues Club lease came through, uh, this is what the Leader of the Opposition said. This is what the Labor Party said. I believe, and I'm quoting here, I believe the Crushers Club may be obliged to take on a fair bit of debt to pay for the upgrade, but any arrangement which helps junior sport and bowls is one that will support. That's right. Did that club have poker machines order, in that order proposal. To you, Councillor Cassidy. I didn't mention Crushers Leagues Club. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you can bet you didn't. Go on. Your point of order. Of order. Um, uh, this question uh, is relating to something that's going on in 2023, not 2019. My question, Chair, was specifically, will the Lord Mayor apologise to Stafford locals and how will Councillor Hammond be reprimanded? I believe the Lord Mayor is being relevant to the question. Uh, thank you. Uh, look, there's no intention to apologise for seeing a community facility upgraded and invested in. It's a fantastic outcome for the community. Now, uh, when the Crushers Leagues Club proposal came through, Labor voted for it. The Leader of the Opposition spoke in favour of it. And they acknowledged and they understood that poker machines were part of that deal. Now, what's happened since then? Unfortunately, Crushers has not been able to progress their proposal. But they have identified someone who can. Because what's being put on the table here is not, is not some kind of licence to print money, like has been dishonestly suggested. What we see here is an obligation to invest millions of dollars into upgrading a community facility. And over and above that, to give an ongoing contribution of hundreds of thousands of dollars back into community sport. That's what's on the table here. And so what we see is a transfer to another organisation who can not only do what Crushers Leagues Club offered, but they can offer another 2.8 uh, million into the upgrade. So a better deal than what Labor voted yes for is now being progressed. This is how dishonest the campaign is. This is how dishonest these people are in suggesting that this is a bad Point deal. Of order. That Point is of order. dishonest. Point, Point of order. Point. Councillor Johnson, please. Point of order to you. Thank you. Um, the meeting's local laws say that uh, no councillor should be referring to members of the public in derogatory ways, which the Lord Mayor is clearly doing. Um, this is just not appropriate to be attacking people like this who signed a petition, and I would ask you to. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, councillors. Councillor Johnson, Count Deputy Mayor, please. I'm sorry. Can is that appropriate? Councillor, please. No interjecting across the floor. Councillor Johnson, to, uh, have you finished your point of order? Because well, I'll, 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 take just, it, I'll make a ruling. I, I would just ask you to, to draw the Lord Mayor back into um, appropriate references to members of the public. There was no specific mention of anyone in particular. It was a, a reference to our campaign. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr Mayor. Chair. Uh, I certainly wasn't referring to a member of the public. Uh, I was referring to the dishonest Labor campaign. Now, it, now you would think, based on um, the material going around and the, the commentary, that. Um, Labor councillors were against poker machines. Right. You would think that that, because that's what they want people to believe, but their record shows you something different. Now, we know that Lord Mayor Jim Sawley is the hero for Councillor Cassidy and his team, the mentor, the person they celebrate more than anyone. Point of order, point now, to, point of order to you, Councillor He knows Cassidy. what's coming here. He knows what's coming. Lord Mayor, please. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about Jim Sawley's legacy in Brisbane. <laughs> Chair, on relevance, Jim Sawley was last Lord Mayor in 2003. This question is about the Stafford Bowls Club and the deal that was done in 2022 and the petition that is closed in 2023. Can you br bring the Lord Mayor back to this question thank, thank about you. treating the people of Stafford with Th respect, thank you. you're now not debating, contempt you're now debating the like point of order. Councillor Cassidy, Lord Mayor, I'll bring you back to the question as posed, please. Well, it's very relevant because it goes to the question of whether Labor supports poker machines or not. 
Now, I'm not going to refer to anything about paper bags in car parks. The mayor doesn't get to ask the questions. I am going to. He's required to answer these questions. You cannot chair a meeting. You are not chairing this meeting appropriately. What is your point of order, Councillor Cassidy? On relevance, the Lord Mayor doesn't get to ask us questions. He is required during question time to answer our questions. You need to start chairing this meeting, Councillor. Thank point you. of order, Mr Chairman. The Lord Mayor is being relevant. Sorry, Councillor Owen. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, could I clarify, is Councillor Cassidy now stating that Jim Sawley is no, lo no longer uh, relevant? That's not a relevant point of order, Councillor Owen. Uh, Lord Mayor, please. Well, we all to, know to that, that poker machines are a big part of the discussion that's going on. They don't want to talk about this because they know what's coming. The most famous lease deal ever in the history of Brisbane City Council. Kedron Wavell Services Club, awarded by Jim Sawley for not 20 years, not 30 years, but 70 years. Whoa. 70 years with 300 poker machines. That is Labor's record, Mr Chair. 300 poker machines with a 70-year lease. The lease end date is 2064. That is Labor's record. So anytime anyone wants to hear anything from this crew, remember that. They love poker machines Lord, and they Lord love Mayor, 70 your, your year leases. Your time has expired. Point of order. Further questions. Chair, point of order. Uh, though I'm up to further questions. Point of order. Point Chair. of order to you, Councillor. I move uh, so much of standing orders to enable me to move a motion. Seconded. You have a motion to suspend standing rules to move a motion. Yes. What is your reason for moving your motion for suspension of standing rules? Well, thanks very much, Chair. I think this is an issue that we need to deal with now, today. This is quite urgent, uh, and I will tell you why this couldn't have been put on the notice paper yesterday. Because close of business yesterday, a petition which was signed by 900 locals calling on council to reopen the tender process for the Stafford Bowls Club closed and that will be presented hopefully today, if not today, next week. We've just asked the Lord Mayor to apologise to those Stafford locals on behalf of their local councillor, Councillor Hammond, because um, she clearly won't do it, uh, for, uh, for saying a genuine community campaign. Her constituents have come to her and said, we want you to represent us. And she said, what you're saying are all mistruths and porkies, and that is uh, completely disrespectful to those people. Uh, they have been very clear what they want to see is the Stafford Bowls Club as a genuine community space for the community. They want to see council invest in that rather than a backroom deal done to give Brisbane Racing Club a licence to print money, because that's exactly what they will do. They're not doing this out of the goodness of their own heart. Uh, so if Councillor Hammond won't apologise of her own volition, this council should require her to do so. So my motion would be that the Lord Mayor apologise to Stafford residents on behalf of LNP Councillor Fiona Hammond for her, for her insulting claims in the media where she labelled community campaigns as porkies and mis truths and that the Lord Mayor and the LNP Council place on hold the current lease agreement for Stafford Bowls Club and open submissions for community organisations and sporting groups to submit alternative point proposals order, with a order. reasonable uh, time frame to develop order, a more Councillor acceptable Cassidy. solution. Oh, excuse me, Councillor Cassidy. The, oh, sorry. There's a point of order. Um, it was about why this is urgent, not about what the debate was. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think you, you're making a point that you want to suspend standing rules to allow the motion, as you've been reading out, to be debated. Yeah, the, uh, people, the people of Stafford demand a better solution than the one that this LNP administration is giving them. Point of order on why it couldn't it be in before one o'clock yesterday? I think, uh, the, I think we heard the answer to that. The motion before us is for the suspension of standing rules. All in favour of the motion for suspension of standing rules, please say aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division has been called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Eyes to the right, noes to the left.
Thank you, Billy. Please close the bars. Clarks, resolve. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 19 against. That motion is lost. Please, councillors, resume your seats. Further questions? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is the Chair of City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee, Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen, last year the Chamber unanimously supported heritage protection for homes in Maruka, but in classic Labor Party fashion, they have done a total 180 and now oppose these protections. Councillor Allen, how do you spell hypocrisy? <laughs> Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor Hammond, for the question. Well, Mr Chair, I've lost track of the number of times I've stood in this very chamber and called out Labor's hypocrisy and myths truths, especially when it comes to the Nathan Salisbury Maruka Draft Neighbourhood Plan and the associated order, heritage Mr. and Chair. character protections. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. The question was, how do you spell hypocrisy? And oh. Councillor Allen is not answering the question. <laughs> uh, and he should really be spelling the word hypocrisy, because if it's been written that badly by the LNP staff members, um, you should hold him to account. He's not allowed <laughs> thank, to thank debate you. the question. He's thank not you, allowed Councillor to interpret Johnson. the question. Thank he you. is required thank you, to Councillor answer Johnson. the question. Thank you, I believe. Well, Councillor well, Allen is being relevant to the question. Well, yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. My, my spelling of hypocrisy will be be ALP, and uh, this is why. So uh, when it comes to Labor, they never let a story, you know, they, they'll push a story without any consideration for the facts. We see this constantly, and this is just another fantastic example. Councillor Hammond is correct. This council, both sides of the chamber, unanimously supported the temporary local planning instrument to protect 180 homes within the Maruka War Workers' Estate in August last year. Councillor Griffiths, during the debate, agreed with this side of the chamber on the temporary protection measures, and I quote, Labor will be, of course, supporting the protection of these important properties, and it's nice to actually have some agreement with all of council in relation to these particular properties. He even applauded the Chamber for protecting and preserving character housing across our city. To reinforce his stance on the protection of character homes in the area, it was during the same meeting that Councillor Griffiths moved a motion to extend such protections to all the draft neighbourhood plan area. He quoted residents moving to the area because of the character. He quoted the residents loved the streets and they loved the character homes. He referenced resident submissions on wanting council to commit to protecting pre-existing 1947 houses. But Mr Chair, I'm not sure what has happened over the past six months since the TLPI was adopted in August, but what I do know is Councillor Griffiths seems to have changed his tune on this matter. This is a temporary protection measure that was once reasonable to the councillor, but now because he has been contacted by residents, has a different perspective. Ah. Council City Architecture and Heritage Team, as part of the neighbourhood planning process, review existing local heritage places and identify any potential new heritage places. It is a process that includes consultation and support from council's independent Heritage Advisory Council. Councillor Griffiths has said that character zoning allowed internal as well as reasonable outside renovations as long as facades were not changed too much. He said, essentially, what was already in place, the character overlay, was good enough to protect these homes. His words, not mine. So if we're to do with what Councillor Griffith wants us to do and overturn a TLPI that was unanimously voted for, we would see poor design outcomes on these heritage homes. And I eagerly await Councillor Griffith's submission on the TLPI and these particular war workers' homes. Now, he further suggested that this is just a distraction from a separate and controversial decision to remove character protection from 200 nearby houses as part of the new neighbourhood plan. Mr Chair, let me be clear on this one. Councillor Griffith is constantly getting this wrong. 
I so certainly don't recall the draft strategy or draft neighbourhood plan stating we were going to remove protections over 200 homes, as Councillor Griffith has repeatedly and incorrectly said. Councillor Griffith's comments fail to acknowledge the overall net increase of 32 pre-1947 properties in the traditional building character overlay. Mr Chair, I do acknowledge that the draft plan does propose the removal of some properties from the traditional building character overlay, but these are properties that don't even have a character home on them or properties that are fractured in the context of the streetscape. They might be a single isolated home between two apartment blocks or, in fact, they might have a community facility on them. So a lot of these do not contain sites that are true character homes. So as I said in the beginning, I truly do await uh, Councillor Griffith's submission on the, uh, the War Workers Heritage Homes. He's clearly had a change of uh, mind on this. So uh, obviously he's got some great uh, academic thought to add to this particular oh. exercise. So I'm sure it'll make good reading. I just think Councillor Griffith needs to get his facts right. He needs to get his head unmuddled. And I'll Councillor leave. Allen, Thank your you, Mr. Chair. time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Sri Ranganathan. Thanks, Chair. My question's to the Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, up in the public gallery today, is, there's a gentleman named Alan who, among other things, he's a war veteran, he's, he's got significantly impaired mobility. Recently, he went to catch a, a bus, and he doesn't live anywhere near somewhere where you can buy a go-card or buy, there's no ticket machines near his home. He misplaced his go-card. And when he went to catch the bus, uh, he was told by the bus driver, we don't accept cash anymore. So I can't let you on. You, you won't be able to ride the bus today. And so after, with significant impaired mobility, after walking all the way to the bus stop, he was denied access to that essential public service and then had to walk a great deal further, which I think is a pretty significant social justice issue. So my question to you, Lord Mayor, is um, what is your message to, to Alan today and what steps will you take to ensure that people who don't have a go-card or a credit card can still access that basic service of public transport? <clears throat> uh, thank you, Councillor Sri Ranganathan, for that question. Uh, it was a good question, and uh, I commend you on um, the first good question that we've seen from your side of the chamber so far. Look, what happened uh, to uh, Alan was unacceptable, and it's unacceptable for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, we see uh, the injustice of a war veteran being denied access to public transport when, day in, day out, Young people are jumping on the bus and not paying and nothing happens. We see this time and time again where, where young people are just refusing to pay because they are taking advantage of this no child left behind approach and, and this is not consistent. And it is unfair for the people that actually do the right thing and are prepared to pay. I have talked to Minister Bailey about this issue myself. Uh, and uh, definitely agree that reform with the way the ticketing works is needed. Uh, and so this is something I'm happy to look at. Uh, frankly, uh, we have to look at uh, opportunities to make sure that there is fairness when it comes to access to public transport. Now, my personal view is that cash is a dying thing and um, you know, it, is is, it has been phased out in a lot of examples. It is, is phased out uh, through... Um, Councillor Johnston, please. Councillor Johnston. Where have you been during the pandemic, Councillor Johnston? Like, seriously, nobody uses cash anymore. Uh, and we see... Point of, order. <laughs> point of order to you, Councillor Sri Ranganathan. Just, just, on, just on relevance, my, my question to the Mayor was, what, what is he doing to ensure that people who don't have go cards or credit cards aren't denied access to public transport? That was the substance of the question. I, I would appreciate a direct answer. Thank I was, you, Lord Mayor. As I, was relevant to the question. Uh, I have had discussions with Minister Bailey about how we can make sure uh, these challenges with ticketing are addressed. Now, first of all, I think one of the most important things that can happen is the new ticketing system can be implemented. Now, sadly, as we see with a lot of examples with the state government, Brisbane gets something new last when it comes to the state government. Uh, we have seen the rolling out of new ticketing for public transport everywhere else in South East Queensland, virtually with the exception of Brisbane. Uh, and that is unfair, given that Brisbane represents the majority of trips being taken across the network. Now, I understand that they might want to test it in certain areas, but the system is working. 
uh, and we're having a very, very slow uh, rollout of the new ticketing Point system. Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you. I'm, I'm that... sorry to interrupt, but my, the new ticketing system is also cashless, so I'm, I'm really asking the Mayor, what's he going to do for people who don't have a go-card, who don't have a credit card, and don't live near somewhere where you can buy a ticket or a go-card? No. It, it's Just a straightforward question. The question was relevant to the go-card, and the Lord Mayor is explaining his now, uh, consultation with the state knows government. that ticketing policy is not set by Brisbane City Council. It is set by TransLink and the state government, which is why I've continually repeated that I have raised these matters with the minister, because they are important matters. They are genuinely important matters. Now, as cash is phased out, and it continues to be phased out in a lot of different examples, that is the future. Um, you know, this is something that's been accelerated by the pandemic. Uh, you go into a lot of shops now and they will tell you that they don't, they're not accepting cash or not encouraging cash. Uh, our parking meters were the first cashless parking meters in Australia and now progressively all councils are rolling out the same approach. Councillor Johnston. And I would also point out that there's another issue here which is an industrial relations one with the RTBU, where the RTBU uh, has said that they don't want to hang, handle cash. They don't, that is their official policy. They do not want to handle cash. So what we see here is a complicated situation, but we need some answers. We need some resolutions from uh, the Minister point and from TransLink. Yeah. And Good we will continue to Could advocate... Point of, point of order, Councillor Shreya. Couldn't Shreya. they have just let the guy on the bus for free? Like, why, why didn't the drivers do that? Yeah, the, Lord Mayor. So... As I was saying before, there's a, there's a lot of people who ride public transport for free at the moment. And there's a fairness issue here. Uh, if, look, if I was the driver, Alan would have been in the front seat before you know it. Uh, and he would have been riding the transport. But obviously, you know, I, I, I can't comment on the situation because I wasn't there. But I would simply say, if, if there's a situation like that, um, you know, some flexibility is good. Some flexibility is something that we would support as a council, particularly given that a massive number of young people are riding for free at the moment, uh, even though they are legally required to pay. Uh, so there needs to be a better ticketing arrangement in place. Uh, we have to accept that cash is on the way out, but there are other ways to do things. And <laughs> please go into yourself. Councillor Johnston. <laughs> Councillor Johnston, please. Yeah. Councillor Johnston, please stop interjecting. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the pandemic apparently didn't happen, Mr Chair. So, um, uh, Councillor Johnson, <laughs> uh, Lord Mayor, your time and has so expired. So we will continue advocating for ticketing policy reform. Thank, Thank you, you, Councillor Further Shreya. questions? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair, and it's lovely to be back in the chamber for the first meeting of the new year. My question today is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor Wines. Councillor Wines, Brisbane is growing at a rapid pace and with more and more people moving here, it means that there are more people on our roads. Can you please update the Chamber on how the Schrinner Council is investing in our growth suburbs to help our residents get home sooner and safer? Thank you. Councillor Wines. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, can I thank Councillor Owen for the question and note her keen and personal interest in ensuring that adequate infrastructure is built and presented for the people of the growth suburbs, particularly in the outer south. Can I also make the important point that uh, while February 14 uh, is for lovers, nobody loves the suburbs more than Lord Mayor Schrinner and his team. <laughs> and can I say uh, that is evidenced so, by so many projects being delivered for the growth suburbs and the outer south in particular. Uh, can I uh, begin by discussing and making reference to the Rochdale Priestdale Road intersection, which, which had its lights turned on only some weeks ago, discussed in committee this morning. That area, the uh, Rochdale area, has seen a population growth from 3,175 in 2016 to 7,633, a growth of 140 per cent in a seven-year period. This means we need to continue to improve infrastructure in that area. Now, consider that that 140 per cent compares to a 9.9 per cent across the whole city. And if I can make mention, my own ward of Inogra grows at about the same rate as the city. So it is a mature community compared to some of our outer suburban ones, which do grow, grow very quickly. I see uh, Councillor Landers in my eye line. Uh, 
we, there, there can't be a moment go by when we talk about road projects in the outer suburbs without mentioning Bracken Ridge Ward, uh, Beams Road, uh, the, tender, the tender has closed. We continue to work on the growth areas of Fitzgibbon and uh, I suppose Zilmere is mature but there is still growth in that Fitzgibbon and Castledine area. Uh, the, I can provide further information to this council that, uh, that Beams Road there are other projects, Councillor Murphy, but there's always there's always room for Bracken Ridge. There's always room for Bracken Ridge. There's another suburb I'll talk about, which um, in a moment, which you may have heard of before, called Polara. But I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Uh, but um, can I assure this council that Beams Road, the tenders have closed, and we have received a number of tenders, which is excellent to ensure that that pro project progresses. We remain keenly committed to that Beams Road project. Now back to Rochdale Preestyle. That former roundabout was carrying uh, roughly 20,000 vehicles per day with significant congestion uh, on all approaches. Can I recognise and thank the contributions of the federal government and note that uh, Minister Treasurer Chalmers and uh, the member for Bonner, Mr Ross Vasta, both attended the light turning on. Uh, we could not have done that project without federal support. Can I also thank Logan City Council for their cooperation and contribution to that uh, uh, particular uh, for that particular project, noting that at the intersection, three of the four corners belong to Brisbane City, but the populated growth corner actually does belong to Logan. So thank you for their cooperation and their financial support for that. Now, uh, while that intersection was congested, the Rochdale Priestdale uh, intersection was congested, there were four crashes requiring medical treatment, uh, and that that does not record ones that did not that near misses or uh, collisions that did not require hospitalisation. Uh, the upgrades there have created a four-lane dedicated pedestrian crossing, excuse me, a four-way uh, dedicated pedestrian crossing uh, for those walking and riding through that with marked improvements for the pedestrian ways through there. Uh, and there'll also be, uh, I trust, a lot of support in this chamber for the recently upgraded Newnham and Wecker intersection at Mount Gravatt, which I can say the pro that particular project was concluded recently with the pedestrian bridge uh, in January of this year, but the road bridge, the roadworks were uh, concluded late last year. That particular intersection had 18 reported crashes in the period 2014 through 2019, and with 13 of those being related to motorists being unable to make a safe turn from Newnham into Wecker due to the high volumes. Now, we focus very much on having a safe and efficient road network, uh, which, will go, which gets residents home sooner and safer. The final project which, which I'll speak to uh, relates directly to Councillor Owen, the questioner from earlier, uh, and it's one that I know that she is very enthusiastic about, and that's, of course, Ritchie Road Corridor Upgrade, which includes a number of projects uh, across a number, a number of years. But the Ritchie Road Corridor project uh, is positioned next to the rapidly growing Polara State School, uh, and Council, uh, I think unreasonably, has been left to carry a burden that should be shared with the State as well. But, uh, unsurprisingly to this council, we always mop up for the state when they let the community down. And this is one more example of that. Uh, the Ritchie Road Corridor has been split into three stages. Uh, and stage one has been delivered in two parts, with the construction of dedicated shoulders and right turns to Polara State School, with a safe crossing point for Ritchie Road for the many hundreds of school children there. But also, I'm running out of time. But we have Councillor done Wines, in fact, the time has expired, uh, and that ends question time for today. Uh, Lord Mayor, Establishment and Coordination Committee recommendations, please. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move the report of the recommendations of the Establishment and Coordination Committee during the summer recess 2022-2023 on matters usually considered by that committee be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor and seconded by the Deputy Mayor that the report of the recommendations of the Establishment and Coordination Committee during the summer recess 2022-2023 on matters usually considered by that committee be adopted. Lord Mayor, is there any debate? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, tonight, uh, the Victoria Bridge, Story Bridge and Radcliffe Place will be lit up in red and blue uh, to support Sweetheart Day. Uh, Sweetheart Day coincides with Valentine's Day, obviously. Uh, and it focuses on supporting all people impacted by childhood heart diseases, which is one of the largest causes of infant death in Australia. Uh, so that is uh, lighting up red and blue, Victoria Bridge and Story Bridge and Radcliffe Place. Uh, tomorrow is the 81st anniversary of the fall of Singapore, and Radcliffe Place and Victoria Bridge will be lit up in red to mark this occasion. 
Uh, there were thousands of Australian soldiers who lost their lives in the battle for Malaya and Singapore, uh, and uh, obviously uh, it was seen as one of the uh, pivotal points in the Second World War, the fall of Singapore, uh, and uh, the impact that that had. Uh, many prisoners of war were killed or died in cap captivity under horrible and horrific circumstances uh, as a result of their capture in the fall of Singapore. Uh, tomorrow night, the Story Bridge will be lit up in yellow to support International Childhood Cancer Day, the day that is observed on the 15th of February every year and honours all the children and families experiencing the effects of this horrid disease. This Sunday, the 19th of February, marks the tragedy of two years since Hannah Clark and her children, uh, Alea, Liana and Trey, uh, were brutally murdered uh, in a uh, horrible case of domestic violence. Uh, Hannah and the kids loved handstands, uh, and you may have seen some councillors doing some handstands recently and question why that is. Uh, well, this is in uh, aid of supporting awareness about the work of uh, Small Steps for Hannah, and it's part of a, an awareness campaign. Um, and thank you to those councillors who have um, uh, defied gravity to um, participate in that challenge. Uh, Councillor Adams would uh, volunteer, but um, she's done enough uh, in recent times. Um, look, I just wanted to, uh, before I move on to the items in front of us, uh, go back to this issue of the Stafford Bowls Club, uh, because we do see a lot of dishonesty circulating around, a lot of misinformation circulating around. And uh, I know that Labor specialises in fake campaigns when it comes to bowls clubs. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a Save the Bolo campaign when the Bolo shut down long ago. Uh, we've seen that happen before. But the reality is, what we want to see here is a better outcome for the community. It's as simple as that. Now, we went through a process which Labor supported in 2019 to agree and approve the best offer that was put forward from the community, and that was the offer by Crushers Leeds Club in 2019 when that new proposal was awarded back then. It was a tender process back then, as we've heard from Councillor Cassidy. Now, what, what does a tender process do? It flushes out and identifies the best offer. The best offer. And so what was the best offer in 2019? Today, we have an even better offer. Today, we have an additional investment of $2.8 million. So let's be very clear what's happened. We got the best offer in 2019, and now we have an additional offer that is better than that. So it came through a competitive process to get the best possible offer in 2019, and that offer has been exceeded. It was okay to award the offer in 2019, and Labor voted for it, yet somehow an even better offer is something they claim to oppose. So this is really uh, an attempt uh, to misrepresent the truth. Uh, it is an attempt um, to suggest that they are somehow against poker machines when we've seen year in, year out, them supporting leases with poker machines in them. We have seen countless across the city clubs and organisations being awarded poker machine licences by the state government. And the last time I checked, it's been a Labor state government for the majority of the last 30 years that awards these licences, yet they want somehow residents to believe that they are suddenly against poker machines. It's dishonest. It is a dishonest campaign. What we'd like to see is a community facility returned back to the community, and what we'd like to see is an investment in that facility that doesn't burden the ratepayers of Brisbane, and what we'd like to see is $200,000 a year going back into community support, and under this lease, that's exactly what we will see. Now, I've talked to a number of people who are genuinely excited to see Stafford Bowls Club revitalised and reopened to the community. Uh, at the moment, you know, it's, it's a community facility which needs investment, and the, the really what it comes down to is, is that investment going to be made through rates, or is that investment able to be made by other operators? And so what we have here is a sporting organisation which is prepared to put in millions of dollars into upgrading the facility, 
and then continue to give back to the community each year uh, without burdening the ratepayers of Brisbane. And so this is a good deal for the community. It is a good deal for ratepayers. Uh, and I'm not going to get into arguments about poker machines. Uh, we all have our own views on poker machines, but I would simply say council doesn't regulate poker machines. We don't have any role in regulating poker machines. That is done by the Labor state government. So if people do have concerns about poker machines, or in fact about racing, then they should raise it with the Labor state government. Both of those things are regulated by the state government. And so this is really a good outcome for the community, and it's really disappointing to see such a dishonest campaign being run, well, it's quite clearly for political purposes. I'd really like to know who has funded the flyers, who has funded the website, uh, who has funded billboard advertising. It's quite clear, it's quite clear, it's quite clear uh, that it has politics 101 written all over it, uh, and it is quite clear uh, that locals are being misled by the Labor Party. Uh, and so that is disappointing, but it is unfortunately not surprising uh, because we've seen it happen time in and time out. When, when, uh, websites, when websites appear with photos of Councillor Cassidy on them, who do you think paid for those websites? Uh, so, That's because look, their local councillor, <laughs> Councillor Fiona Hammond, is a champion for her community and she wants the best for her community. Councillor Cassidy please. just wants to play petty party politics uh, and that is a shame. Now moving to the items in front of us, uh, items A, B and C are the contracts and tendering reports for October, November and December 2022. Uh, in these reports, 81 out of 88 contracts are being awarded to local suppliers, being 92% of contracts uh, and obviously exceeding our 80% target. 80% uh, target being the number of contracts being awarded to local uh, businesses and suppliers. Uh, in the financial year to date, 88% of contracts have been awarded to local suppliers. Uh, and so we're approximately halfway through the financial year. Uh, and certainly at, at the December point, we are halfway. Uh, and in that time, 88% of contracts were awarded to local suppliers with a total of $777 million going into local business in our local area. Uh, included in these contracts are the construction of the Dockside and Mowbray Park ferry terminals, uh, the construction of the new Brisbane International Cycle Park, uh, the Shorncliffe Escarpment Works, uh, the, there's a number of service relocations to facilitate road and infrastructure upgrades, and also the first round of our uh, Sunsafe Suburban Playgrounds program. Uh, we have uh, in front of us those three items. Uh, moving on to item D, uh, the Gardner Road Extension uh, Project. Uh, obviously, uh, I heard the uh, speaker earlier, and I'm heartened that um, Councillor Wines will follow up on that correspondence. Uh, this is a project, though, um, that has a time imperative. Gardner Road Extension needs to happen as soon as possible. Uh, it is a project that is impacted by surrounding works, including uh, the construction of the Metro Depot. Uh, it is a project that is impacted by surrounding work, such as the, uh, the South East Busway extension down through to Springwood, which the State Government is progressing. And what we see here is that uh, the construction of the South East Busway extension, um, together with the nearby adjacent Metro Depot works, uh, will require the closure of School Road or a section of School Road. Now that school road connection uh, is obviously uh, an important connection in a growing area and we need to replace that connection uh, with the Gardner Road extension. And so there is a time imperative here which is why we're progressing with uh, the uh, notice of intention to resume in the project. Uh, but obviously when it comes to uh, the specific detail... Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Move for extension. Second. Seconded. Extension of time for the Lord Mayor has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it, Lord Mayor. Uh, when it comes to the uh, specific details of uh, individual properties, obviously this is a process that is subject to discussion and negotiation with, with property owners. 
Now, obviously, this is a process which has a formal objection period, but there are also legal rights that owners have uh, if they don't believe uh, that the process has been a right process or a fair process. Now, obviously, uh, we will do our best to make sure that it is a fair process. But in this case, uh, what it appears is that uh, Council is planning for uh, ultimate upgrades that need to occur in the future, uh, whether that is the creation of a wider road or a new bikeway, and I know there's already been sections of bikeway built on either side of this property, uh, we need to accommodate for the future. And so uh, this process will obviously um, uh, continue to be pursued by Councillor Wines, but we do need to progress uh, with the construction of the Gardner Road extension. Uh, as I said, this project does have a time imperative. Uh, Councillor Huang has made it very, very clear that uh, he supports local residents when it comes to their need for a new road connection to replace School Road. He has advocated very strongly for that. Uh, and, but obviously we, we all want to see, and Councillor Huang and Councillor Wines want to see uh, a fair and right process. Uh, and that's uh, what I want to happen in this case. Uh, so uh, that's item D. Uh, item F is the minor administrative amendments to the Brisbane City Plan, package M. Uh, Council's planning scheme is constantly changing so that it can remain in line with community and industry expectations and the need to provide uh, more housing uh, as our city grows. In December, uh, the state government made changes to the planning regulation as it relates to rooming accommodation. According to the state, uh, the amendment is uh, intended to streamline approvals for rooming accommodation to provide greater housing diversity in the low-density residential zone, low-medium density residential zone as well. Uh, Council is required to adopt this policy change into its planning scheme without variation. Uh, some of the variations include changes to small-scale rooming accommodation and dwelling houses in the low-density residential zone to provide statewide consistency, allowing, allowing yes. small-scale rooming accommodation without requiring planning approval, such as a material change of use uh, in lower density residential zones where certain requirements can be met, and enabling council to require a planning approval for a dwelling house uh, developments in the high density residential zone and medium density residential zone. Uh, in addition, some zoning and overlay changes are being made to reflect current development approvals. Now, in commenting on this, and I made it very clear that we are required and effectively being forced to implement this, uh, I do, and I know a number of councillors do, have some concerns about the impacts that this may deliver. In fact, as the Deputy Mayor says, major concerns. Why is that? Because uh, we have, as a council, uh, previously led the way in trying to regulate uh, rooming accommodation to manage its impacts in local communities. Uh, and so uh, we moved to in introduce our own local requirements into the city plan, uh, which were working well. They were working well. And Councillor Johnston, please, stop interjecting. Uh, Councillor Johnston doesn't think anything's working well anywhere. Uh, and, and look, we know that's very predictable, but the reality is they were working well. Now the state government has stepped in to have a statewide approach which totally wipes out the local requirements that we had and replaces them with more generic requirements. Uh, but what it will mean is that in local residential neighbourhoods, people were having more rooming accommodation popping up. That's what it will mean. It will mean that the impacts of rooming accommodation won't be as effectively managed as what we've seen uh, in recent times. And uh, Councillor Adams points out that it's a change, uh, there's a change to the number of people in, that are unrelated in one particular dwelling. And what's that change, Councillor Adams? More than ever. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we've limited it in the past to five. Five unrelated people in one dwelling. Uh, they will now be able to have more than five unrelated people in one dwelling. So um, you can actually really imagine some of the impacts that this change will have. Um, but that's what happens when the state government steps in with a one-size-fits-all approach to planning, uh, which hasn't been thought out in terms of local impacts. Uh, so, uh, look, you know, it's one of those things. Um, we have been forced to do this. Uh, we don't necessarily believe it's the best outcome, um, but I think that what we will see down the track is um, concerns being raised by the community, and hopefully at that point in time, 
the state government will change their mind about uh, the way this is implemented. Uh, so, uh, Mr Chair, that is uh, item F. Thank you for the speakers. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak on all of these items before us today and just ask that item, get the right uh, clause, clause D be taken seriatim for voting, please. Clause D seriatim for debate voting. and voting or just, just voting? voting just voting, yeah, thank voting, you. Yep. Um, so starting uh, together on the, the first three items, A, B and C, which is the contracts and tendering for October, November and December. Now this um, lazy LNP administration is not only contracting everything out, uh, they're now too lazy to bother bringing these items to Council in a timely manner uh, for scrutiny. Uh, the, some of the contracts before us today were awarded five months ago. Uh, so councillors are now reviewing um, some of this expenditure, looking at these, uh, this contracting out five months after the decision has already been made. And there's no reason uh, those contracts couldn't have been brought to council last year um, or last week or the week before if the Lord Mayor wasn't off on his overseas junket playing with flying taxis uh, and the start of this council year wasn't delayed. Uh, in the first three items we see before us, A, B and C, there's over $60 million worth of external contracts. And there is a very common thread throughout all of these, and that tells the story of this LNP administration. It's not the story the Lord Mayor would like to tell you, but it's that they're lazy, out of touch and have forgotten the suburbs of Brisbane. Uh, and no amount of political spin will cover the reality. Um, the first contract is for the extension of road surface inventory solution. Uh, an interesting title. Um, you, you might be better off getting an entirely new system uh, together, considering that the Lord Mayor and Councillor Marks have repeatedly said that if people out in the suburbs want potholes filled, they need to report them, uh, rather than Council carrying out proactive maintenance. How lazy of the LNP to say we're going to spend millions of dollars on a road maintenance um, solution, an IT solution, but still requiring residents to be the, the eyes on the street and report all of those failures to council for, before, they can be, uh, before they can be rectified. There's a contract for a consultancy to support flood impact assessment on the road network um, a, year, a year after uh, the 2022 flood. We're seeing this come through. Uh, and after 20 years of rule in Brisbane, two major flood events now, um, several smaller flood events throughout that time, you think this LNP administration would have prioritised flood risk management and have a plan to prevent damage and deal with disaster as they happen. But no, of course, not under this LNP mayor. The confusion, poor planning and lack of basic services in the suburbs continue. Uh, there is a drainage project in my ward uh, listed here, which I am of course happy to see completed finally. Uh, the item is repairing a concrete channel in Washington Street, Deegan, and that is very, very long overdue. I saw the Lord Mayor gloated about it in his political flyer that he sees election uh, flyer that he sent out just recently, saying that um, uh, that this this drainage channel will be repair, what he failed to mention in that flyer uh, was that it's been awaiting repair for five years. It's been identified by council and collapsing for the last five years. I had a meeting on site with a resident uh, and a former, now former council officer um, whose pro that, their, that resident's property was subsiding into the drain back in October 2018. That project had been identified prior to that meeting as well, but was getting very bad by that point. Five years later, we're finally seeing a contract to fix that drain. Uh, when the LNP mayor of this city, and he very much is the mayor of the city only, uh, not the suburbs, when he says he cares about the suburbs, uh, he is telling, what's his word? Mistruths. He's telling mistruths. Uh, because you can't listen to what he says, you must look at what he does. Uh, and not enough is being spent on the suburbs. We've got another $14 million, uh, being spent in contracting out basic cleaning services, so the cleaning of park facilities, suburban shopping areas and boat ramps, really basic ongoing council work uh, that is now being contracted out with no assurances of decent work practices and good wages. We, 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 we see the reports and the, the, um, uh, the audit committee and those things where they mention they look into these things, and yet we see continually under this LM 
LNP administration examples of where uh, workers are being done over. The LNP have a shocking track record when it comes to ensuring contracted out jobs aren't seeing workers ripped off. And there's a very recent example, but there's plenty of others. Um, so what assurances as councillors do we have that these workers won't get ripped off, like HCL IT staff uh, whose wages were stolen, uh, or the staff at the Pig and Whistle, a council-owned facility uh, in the mall, um, the, the ferry staff, of course. Uh, under the LNP, no worker is safe. Uh, we've also got contracting out of carpentry services. Um, these are for jobs that are big and small on council-owned buildings and facilities. So this is carpentry work that council requires doing on council-owned facilities. Um, that would be carrying out planned maintenance each and every year and responding to emerging issues. Now, this is, the, this is exactly the kind of work that Council should be doing in-house, where they're supporting the training of apprentices and employing um, tradespeople. Uh, this contract's for $2.2 million. You can just imagine how many uh, uh, apprentices and ongoing staff uh, you could employ uh, with that ongoing money being used for contracting out of these basic services. Uh, and it is, of course, I think next week, or maybe starting this week, National Apprentice Week. And here we see an item before us today where this LNP administration is contracting out um, opportunities for apprentices to get a start here in Brisbane City Council. Quite shameful of the LNP. There's a contract for bus driver amenities, chemical upgrades. They always put funny names to try and throw you off the scent. They don't really describe exactly uh, what this is for when it's described as bus driver amenities chemical upgrades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but two years ago, Labor councillors alongside the RTBU raised the issue of drivers being forced to use portable chemical toilets that weren't up to standard. Yeah. They were dirty, they were broken, and in some cases they were dangerous. The LNP laughed off this issue. I just heard Councillor Murphy have a little giggle then. I remember how they laughed and laughed about bus drivers not having adequate toilet facilities back then. Uh, and um, the, the Lord Mayor even went so far as to make you know, toilet jokes uh, and deride oh, people right. uh, at the time. Well, two years later, two years it's taken this LNP administration to finally do something. We're seeing a contract um, to supposedly upgrade these facilities. They're still not permanent toilet facilities for our drivers, but at least this is something, I suppose. But you have to ask yourself, why should it take two years uh, why should it take workers to continually raise these problems? Why should it take political pressure and councillors bringing photos of these facilities into this chamber and tabling them for the LNP to finally say, all oh, right, we will provide toilet facilities as a human right to our bus drivers? Uh, just, you know, it's a basic human right uh, and it's a disgrace. Um, I couldn't help but noticing, of course, the contract. We've had one of these before, a contract for project management for an external contract. So they're getting another external contractor in to project manage an external contract. This one's for the fit out of, fit out of council's CBD offices. I assume that's the Brisbane Square uh, fit out uh, just up the road. You would think um, that in an organisation of 9,000 odd people here in Brisbane City Council, that we would have one person uh, on the books, a, a permanent employee that works for council, is carrying out council's duties, would be able to project manage. But I guess when you spend the last 20 years uh, with a political policy of contracting out as much as you possibly can, we've got to the point now where there are multiple contracts getting external contractors to come in and manage other external contracts. Uh, it is absolutely crazy. Uh, and it's no, no wonder when you look at all these that, records, uh, that rates are at record highs, um, but residents aren't seeing a good return on that money out in the suburbs. Uh, and I've saved the last two uh, clangers uh, for the end, Chair. The contract uh, for uh, publicly an undisclosed amount of money for a company to provide data sets to find short-term rental accommodation in Brisbane. Now, this is the culmination, of course, this contract of Adrian Schrinner's plan to ease the housing crisis in Brisbane. This was the one and only action he was taking, uh, was to increase rates on short-term rental accommodation, Airbnbs and the like. Um, when um, asked what he was doing 
uh, to play his role in addressing the housing crisis. He said that Airbnb tax was a way of getting those short-term rentals back into the long-term rental market. Now we've read uh, with interest a few days ago in an article that there were 394 properties had been picked up using this data and will now pay 50 per cent higher rates. Council is now receiving around, according to those reports, $440,000 more in rates revenue this year. Uh, and of course, $440,000 more in rates revenue each and every year if those properties remain in that category. But we were assured at the time that this wasn't about revenue. And in fact, the finance chair, uh, Councillor Cunningham, declared that she would be happy if this new rating category didn't raise a single dollar. Um, but we're seeing now it's raising $440,000. Councillor Cassidy, your time has expired. Thank you. Move for an extension. Second. Extension of time for Councillor Cassidy has been moved by Councillor Cook and seconded by Councillor Strunk. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. So, um, was this rates category really about more rates? We're, we're, it's not clear yet because it's, it's been many months now since the Lord Mayor's budget. Um, uh, uh, seven, or getting on seven months later now, this new rating category is brought in, and um, uh, these properties have been uh, have been issued rates notices now. And you'd imagine one was self-nominated, a, a couple of dozen were um, dobbed in by neighbours, and the bulk of these were done through data harvesting, um, which 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 we have, of course, paid for. We can't say how much, though, because that's all commercial and confidence. So was this really, I suppose, the question for the Lord Mayor to answer? Was this really about getting more uh, private rentals in the market, or was it about revenue? Um, he needs to be able to tell us now how many of those 394 properties that were identified using this contract have been returned to the private market? Because you can assume that this policy was supposedly all about was, was encouraging the owners of those properties to get that higher bill, to immediately ring council and say, we're going to stop renting these out as Airbnbs and we're going to get them back into the private rental market. And if he um, can't deliver on that, then the sum total of his response to the housing crisis has failed. Uh, so he has an opportunity today in summing up uh, his ENC remarks and answering a very simple question. How many of those properties have now been returned to the private rental market? Um, because you know, apparently, uh, it, well, if he can't answer that, there's something very disturbing there. Uh, if he won't answer it, then we know uh, that that was more about revenue raising than that was about responding uh, to the housing crisis. Um, at all, but of course, you know, there's a whole lot of um, confusion uh, in, in the Lord Mayor uh, at the moment. Uh, he seems a bit panicked in his approach to a lot of things. Uh, but there will be a lot of confusion about what council's role can be, and council can do a lot in the absence of a housing strategy. We heard today that apparently Councillor Allen's been working on this housing strategy. We don't know when he started. That was, of course, promised back in back in 2019. Uh, we, we know from a, a file request and looking at that file, it was about that thick, that file, because it had one document in it, uh, where, where there was a bit of background research done by some council officers and no intervention by, uh, by the LNP administration about progressing a housing strategy at the end of last year. Uh, so presumably over Christmas maybe they've done a bit of work and they will announce something. But in the absence of a leader who has a vision for the suburbs of Brisbane, this is the kind of response we will continue to get, uh, this small piecemeal approach where uh, he is trying to plug up holes left, right and centre without any broad vision for the people of Brisbane. Now, finally, the Transport and Infrastructure Futures Board. I'm surprised the Lord Mayor didn't talk about this one because a few of his friends are on it, yes. are being appointed uh, by, him, uh, by, by him to serve on this board. Now, last time this item came to Council, it was at a cost of $250,000, um, which was bad enough because at the time, of course, it was being used to feather the nests, nests of LNP members and fellow travellers. Well, that cost is now blown out to $320,000, with LNP mates still being looked after. Michael Calabiano is still on there collecting his pay, and another LNP friend, John Cotter, has joined as well. Um, he, he is, he, uh, yeah, uh, he is. He, maybe they'll swap out. Uh, 
He is reported to have been on the LNP State Executive and also an LNP fundraiser, an LNP fundraiser at all levels of the party for council campaigns as well as state and federal campaigns as well. I'm sure the, um, perhaps the, the, the LNP want to take this contract uh, seriatim and not vote on it because clearly that's a conflict of interest in appointing your fundraiser to a publicly funded board position so he can uh, he can personally gain from that and pay for it. So you know, he is heavily involved in LNP internal politics. Uh, it's not so clear what he what skills he brings to this board, however. Uh, given the track record of transport and infrastructure projects under this LNP administration, uh, this board is either giving bad advice or the Lord Mayor isn't taking it. But either way, residents are not getting good value for money here. Um, to get a cushy job uh, in, under this LNP administration, you either need to be a former LNP politician or an LNP candidate or be an LNP fundraiser. It's good if you can get it, I guess. Uh, sometimes, I suppose, you can pause and wonder you know, at why people are so roundly losing faith in politics and representative government quite rapidly uh, in, in Western democracies. And I guess if you read through the LNP's priorities laid out before us and particularly see very egregious things like that, giving your mates and fundraisers jobs, publicly funded jobs, on boards like that, um, you get a very clear picture that this LNP administration and their fellow travellers are in it for themselves and not for the people of Brisbane. Uh, a couple of local projects that the Lord Mayor mentioned, I'll just uh, mention briefly here as well. The Zilbia, Zilmia Library upgrade, uh, a long time coming. I'm pleased to have campaigned uh, on this upgrade uh, at the last election and sought commitments from the Lord Mayor and now see that lobbying is paying off for my community. This upgrade will service the growing community of Zilmia, uh, but it of course just scratches the surface down there. The 2021 census confirms that Zilmia is an area that still faces significant challenges and is riven with inequality. It's an important area for me, but also for Brisbane, uh, with <coughs> such rich cultural diversity and the home to a large number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. This community community has so much potential and uh, we hope that, uh, uh, that we can support them uh, with a council after the next election, uh, with a change of administration and a Labor council that can support them on the ground. We need a bigger, better community centre. The O'Callaghan Park master plan needs to be completed and we need more spin on local drainage footpaths and parks in that part of the world. The Shawnkov Escarpment project uh, is one that is welcomed by the community and is being funded by the federal government. The small section that is, uh, this funding covers will see a great community benefit. The strong feedback I've received from local residents is that not enough ongoing basic maintenance is being carried out on the rest of the escarpment. Uh, the escarpment has not been managed properly for too long uh, and it takes more than a business as usual approach. Uh, of funding that the LNP continue to offer. Uh, time and again, when these issues are raised, the answer is the same. The Lord Mayor hasn't allocated enough money in his budget for ongoing maintenance. Um, we need a better approach in council. If the Lord Mayor is willing, a story right everywhere across the city in terms of uh, basic maintenance. So if the Lord Mayor is willing to allocate an additional $400 million to his inner city metro project, he must be willing to spend a few million more on suburban parks and open spaces and give the people of Brisbane the kind of service they deserve. Um, Clause D, the Gardner Road project. Um, there's not a lot of information uh, that was provided by the public speaker today, included in the papers before us today, to make a decision on. Um, you know, we know at face value any resumption can be traumatic, uh, and we have seen recently a number of resumptions that are being challenged on various grounds. And you certainly hope they're being th th the negotiations are being handled fairly, and there is a decent outcome for everyone involved. And sometimes resumptions are absolutely necessary and unavoidable as well but from from you know and on, and on paper they're a very easy exercise uh, for ENC to look at this they look at a map and they see a, a drawing and a line they can make a decision and and traffic planners and project engineers can look at this but there is a real there's a real human face to all of this and we heard that earlier um, today uh, and given that extra information you know we, we perhaps would have supported 
this item going through today, uh, and even with the assurances that Councillor Wines is going to look, look, at, look at some, some information that he's provided while the project still continues, I don't think is good enough, um, given, given what, what we have learnt today. So this is now an item that we won't be um, supporting. Whether now the question isn't whether there will be a fair and decent outcome for the people who are involved in having their, their properties or part of their properties resumed is whether they are required at all. Uh, so I think that needs to be looked at further. Um, so we, we can't support that item today. Uh, clause E is the um, LGIP amendments. Um, so this item is for specific amendments to the city plan to ensure the currency of certain policies. Some of the things covered include dog parks, wood barbecues, shade over playgrounds, standards for park embellishments, etc. Um, the proposed changes are going to now, as we see, be consulted alongside the LGIP 1B amendment, which went through Council in November last year. Sounds ominous. Um, it seems a bit strange um, that this item's brought through now uh, and wasn't included with those LGIP amendments last year, um, because it seems almost like the administration realised these policies needed to be updated to to, pro um, uh, to progress the amendments um, to the LGIPs, uh, to the LGIP that needed to be consulted on. Um, so the consultation on the LGIP now has been delayed. It was dealt with in this council chamber in uh, November last year. It's now, the consultation has now been delayed because of the delay in the update to these policies. Now, our concerns with the LGIP were well litigated last year, uh, so I certainly won't be going into too much of that at the moment. Uh, the process around the LGIP, what's included, uh, and what's not. Councillor Cassidy, your time has expired. Move for an extension. Second. We have an extension of time moved by Councillors Cook and Strunk. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cassidy. Won't be a record. Uh, so those concerns were well litigated. Uh, the process of what's included and what's left out um, left a lot to be desired for residents um, who are seeing their rates go up uh, to record high levels, but are seeing a lot less for that rates money out in the suburbs. We worry that these policy changes will be hollow too. Um, clause F, uh, the minor amendments to city plan. These amendments seem uh, uh, minor on paper when you go through the volumes of um, attachments there, and we've heard one of those is around um, the requirements around rooming accommodation. Uh, there is an enormous amount of attachments provided, and that's fair enough. There's lots of changes um, throughout those, uh, those codes and those sections of the city plan. And on face value, they reflect zoning changes in uh, uh, some circumstances and code changes in others, but in many places, little explanation is provided. Uh, there's many changes to acceptable and performance outcomes relating to code changes, but what those outcomes mean in reality uh, for residents isn't made clear in the proposed amendments at all. Uh, there's just a standard note against all of them which says the exact same thing and doesn't explain what is changing. So we have learnt on this side of the chamber, like the people of Brisbane, you simply can't trust what the LNP uh, say uh, when it comes to amendments to city plan, uh, and therefore we won't be voting in favour of these amendments. Thank you. Further debate? Councillor Landers. Thank you, Chair. And I rise to speak on item C in the Zilmia Library. Uh, one of the first um, events I attended and was very lucky to um, celebrate the opening of the Brackenridge Library in November of 2019 with the Lord Mayor. And uh, it was a very welcomed and um, uh, fantastic upgrade that the community has embraced. So uh, at that time, I felt that residents in Zilmia and the surrounds could also benefit from upgrades to the Zilmia Library. So before the last election uh, in December 2019, I created an online petition to harness community support from the residents. In fact, I requested it in my very first newsletter. So, um, of course, libraries are well-loved community hubs, and Zilmia Library is no different. And obviously it's more than books that we now uh, borrow from the library. Um, so this maintenance and upgrade was very important, so I was delighted when the new refurbishment plan was announced. The 2021-22 budget saw, saw the design phase, and we are now beginning this month the structural works. The refurbishment will include a new entrance, 
a vibrant new children's area, a dedicated young adult area, upgraded public toilets and amenities, improved seating for study and reading, upgrades to internal finishes including new carpet furniture and feature lighting, and improved external landscaping. And one of the unique and exciting changes to the external landscape will be the establishment of a bush tucker garden, which is something I'm very passionate about. Community and cultural heritage advisors from the local area have been engaged in consultation for the design and this project has received financial assistance through the State Library of Queensland. Chair, I'm very excited that works are beginning this month and I know that all councillors value our libraries and will join me in supporting this exciting upgrade. Further debate? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you. I rise to speak on uh, all of the items in uh, the ENC report today. Um, firstly, can I just make some comments on the three uh, contract and tendering reports? Um, like Councillor Cassidy, I also noticed um, that the LNP has been very slack in bringing through their statutory obligations to disclose contracts publicly uh, via this council. And there's just no excuse for that. Um, they have an ENC meeting that lasts approximately 30 minutes once a week. Uh, so it's not like they're out of time in making sure that these reports are brought through in a timely way. We met well into December, so there is absolutely no reason why uh, the October and certainly the November reports could not have been brought through uh, before this date. And of course it's now mid-February because the Lord Mayor cut council meetings so he could go on an overseas junket. So it's really not good enough um, that these contracts are only being disclosed in some cases five months after they were entered into. There are a number of uh, issues in the, uh, in the reports themselves and, and I too noted on page six that a number of LNP people are getting a rails run uh, without any kind of accountability um, for their appointment to the uh, Transport and Infrastructure Futures Board. Um, there's no minutes, there's no actions, there's no outcomes. Um, and yet these people are going to be paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, most of them LNP mates, which I think is very uh, problematic. There is no reason to have this board. Um, uh, the Lord Mayor could save $320,000 and invest that in any kind of uh, flood relief, road upgrades, uh, footpath upgrades, backflow valves, stormwater drainage, helping natural disasters here and overseas. Uh, but instead, a number of LNP mates are being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars unnecessarily, in my view, and I don't support it. Um, so uh, that is not acceptable. I did note the extraordinary amounts of money going into the LNP libraries, um, $11.6 million for Everton Park and $1.5 million for Zilmere. And um, I, I listened... Is it? Oh. Is it? Oh, I thought. I thought. I thought. I thought Councillor Landis said it was her library. Well, I I, I note um, I note that Councillor uh, Griffiths has just left uh, uh, left the chamber, but I'm sure he'd agree with me that we'd just like a little bit of action on Annerley Library. I mean, it's that old, that tiny, uh, and it's uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Councillors, this is, please. This is unacceptable. There's been too much interjecting across the floor. I ask all councillors to observe the proper processes, please. That was actually Councillor Adams screaming across the chamber at me while I was speaking. Yeah, she did it twice. Point and of order. I know that she's order you, not Councillor being called Adams. out by name when she does it. Councillors, I've pointed out uh, uh, all sides have been not observing the proper processes in this place. I ask you all to do so, please. I ask that that is recognised that that was a mistruth that Councillor Johnson just verbal that I screamed across. Uh, let's, Councillor, Councillor Johnson, uh, uh, there's been an objection to the use of the word screaming. Will you withdraw the, uh, that observation? Okay. I, I'm just, uh, just referring. Mr. Refer Chairman, I, I just, how would you describe it? It's not up to me to, re it's not up to, me to make it? a description on, of it. How would you describe it's, it? It's not up to not me to was. describe it, Councillor Johnson. Oh, I'm pointing out to you that the, if there was an objection raised by another councillor. If you don't withdraw, that's fine. Thank you. Please proceed. Yep. 
Um, so I know that Councillor Griffiths would agree with me. All we want is a little bit of money for the Annerley Library, um, which has been neglected by this LNP administration for years and years and years. And I note that Councillor Landers stands up and says it's great that we have all these wonderful libraries uh, in Brisbane, but uh, uh, she's not prepared to support ones that are outside her ward, other than that apparently in Councillor in Deegan Ward, in, in, in Councillor Cassidy's ward, so I, I don't know what's going on there. Um, very briefly, um, there are a couple of other issues in here. Um, there's a significant amount of money going to sports field renovations, $4.8 million. It's unclear to me whether that includes Gordon Thompson Oval at Chelmer, but that's something that I'll be following up on. Um, despite that being announced as a budget uh, project this year, very little seems to have happened. Um, with respect to item D, uh, which is the Gardner Road extension process, uh, that's been taken seriatim. Uh, project, sorry, that's been taken seriatim. Um, I don't support proceeding with that after listening to the speakers earlier today. Obviously, we need some more information, uh, and that's obviously of great concern to those residents. Um, item E, uh, the planning scheme changes for the local government infrastructure plan, and this is the parks. Right, this is the Parks one. Um, this is really odd, what's going on here. And firstly, I want to put on the record that I don't support the Lord Mayor's decision to get rid of uh, wood-fired barbecues in this city. Um, over many, many years, the Lord Mayor has consistently removed wood-fired barbecues from council parks and not replaced them. Um, uh, there's one in my ward in Rowlandson Park in Yoronga, and council is taking out the wood-fired barbecue but not replacing it. And I know this is an issue Councillor Strunk has raised um, on many occasions before here, but today council policy is being changed to completely write out wood-fired barbecues out of um, council's policy. Uh, to me, um, you know, that's a pretty sad kind of situation because uh, if, the, if, if there was going to be a viable alternative. Um, that would be great, but there's not, because this LNP administration refuses to replace old barbecues, uh, and that is incredibly disappointing. So I don't support um, the Lord Mayor's decision to remove wood-fired barbecues uh, by essentially uh, airbrushing them out of council policy altogether. There are a number of other issues in here that are really I, 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 I don't know what council's thinking with this because what council is saying in the policy before us today is absolutely 100 per cent at odds with what our local, can't even call them parks officers anymore because they don't exist, but local council officers say to us. So council is actually um, finally saying that shade provision is a key consideration in playground design. Well, I've been here 15 years, and uh, if I do a new playground, a shade sale is a critical part of that. I can't believe Council's just deciding it's a good idea to put it into policy today. It's a little bit too late. Um, but the bigger problem is that Council is continuing to say um, that the use of advanced stock, so trees, uh, should be planted to provide natural shade uh, for playgrounds. Now, every single playground I've got, council officers want to move out from underneath trees. Robinson Park Fairfield, I'm having a battle with them at the moment. I want to keep playgrounds where there is natural shade. That's what this policy is actually saying, but what council is actually doing is moving them out away from under the trees. And the reason they're doing that is because uh, roots are impacting on safety. Understandable. But here we are enshrining into this policy that we are going to be planting more trees around playgrounds whilst being told as a matter of only weeks ago that no councillor, you cannot keep your playground there because there are trees there. I do not understand what Council is doing with respect to this. It says here that the trees should be selected uh, to, um, so they're not toxic, they have non-invasive roots. Well, great, non-invasive roots. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see a tree that roots you know, don't have some impact on the ground. It's just not possible. Um, that we have to be care uh, acceptable leaf litter, fruit fall, they have to be climate resilient. 
Uh, they have to be consistent with the surrounding landscape. Now, look, I am all for trees around playgrounds, but the big problem here is what the LNP are saying in this policy is not what they are doing as of just a couple of weeks ago in this city. So I would like someone to explain what the new policy is around trees, why I am being forced to move playgrounds in my ward <coughs> out from under natural shade when that does not comply with council policy. And this is the policy, because that's not acceptable. And I can tell you I'm going to go back now, right now, to our PPI officers and say, hang on a minute, you know when you told me I had to move Robinson Park playground upgrade out into the sun? Not doing that. I don't have to. Council policy says you can have trees and you can have playgrounds under trees. So I don't know what's going on here, um, but there's a mismatch between what council says it's doing and uh, what it's actually doing. Uh, finally, with respect to item F, and I'd ask its move seriatim for uh, voting purposes as well. Firstly, in August 2020, I moved a motion to prevent rooming accommodation. Uh, to start changes to city plan to prevent rooming accommodation. The deputy mayor at the time stood up and absolutely bagged me, um, blocked that motion from being considered and then voted against it. Um, she said at the time there was a housing policy coming. It's never come. Two and a half, nearly three years later, and there is nothing from this LNP administration. And now they're working hand in glove with George Street and the ALP to force boarding houses into low density areas and character residential areas in this city. Councillor and I do not Johnston, support it. Your time has you finished your time. Thank you very much. Mr. Councillor Chair, Landers. I move that council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. Thank you. We have a motion for an afternoon tea break moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. The mic is now on. For, thank you, Councillors. Further debate on the ENC recommendations report, please. Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Chair. I'm very excited to talk about items A and C in this week's ENC report, but I don't know where to start with my gratitude or excitement. Like all good things, it takes a few years to get to where we are today, and it wouldn't have been possible without a few amazing people. Firstly, I want to thank our Lord Mayor and Councillor Davis. Thank you so much for believing and supporting in this vision. When we started designing the Murray Recreation Reserve upgrade, the budget, let's just say, was a little bit smaller. But over the years, we could all see the potential of attracting local and international cycling events to Brisbane and the huge economic benefit it would have for our community. We could also see the opportunities for our juniors to train and advance their skills to hopefully one day be standing on the podium at the 2032 Olympics right here in Brisbane and the opportunity for local cyclists to ride off the road on a dedicated cycling track to provide a safer option for so many to train or to have a leisurely ride with others. I also wanted to say a very big thank you to Helena from our City Projects office. You have, been, you have designed this project within an inch of perfection, transforming the Murray Recreation Reserve into the Brisbane International Cycle Park. You're an incredible officer to work with. You took all of mine and the community's feedback on board and together we'll soon have one of the best cycling facilities in Australia. Now to my excitement. Works are starting at the reserve this Thursday, which include a new dedicated cycle track separated from the walking track. Why I'm so excited is because this is probably the most complaints I ever got in my office. Cyclists going 70 kilometres an hour, dodging um, pedestrians, people on their scooters, like younger kids on scooters or bikes, dogs trying to bite the wheels. Uh, bike riders hated it and pedestrians also hated it. So to have them separated is amazing. So this, amongst many other things, will make the Murray Recreation Reserve an international cycle track and one that we should all be so proud of. So from the bottom of my heart, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has supported this incredible project. The people of Doughboy, thank you. The speakers, Councillor Sri Ranganathan. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on the uh, item D, the Roachdale project. I'll speak on the uh, planning amendments in terms of short-term accommodation and 
uh, uh, and accommodation, sorry. And yeah, might just briefly start though by talking about the contract in terms of the, the data gathering to identify sh short term accommodation properties. Because I think, um, yeah, Councillor Cassie was perhaps, I don't know, I guess I, do, I just disagree with you slightly that it's necessarily a bad thing for the council to be raising re revenue via rates from. Um, transitory accommodation properties. I, I, I think um, I, reasonable people can probably argue about what the uh, administration's main objectives were in introducing the new ratings category. I, I believe they probably were intended to discourage uh, transitory accommodation in certain areas, but it's pretty obvious that the rates uh, increases haven't been high enough to encourage landowners to do that. And I would suggest to the Deputy Mayor and the um, Chair of Finance and, and other relevant decision makers that for the coming Council budget it would be appropriate to increase the, the rates uh, significantly for that class of property or that category of land use. The I increase that was introduced last time around simply hasn't been high enough to shift the behaviour of property investors and I think Deputy Mayor there's an obligation on the part of Council here to ensure that res accommodation that was designed as long-term residential housing is not converted into short-term hotel uses on a, on a massive scale. I was interested to see the figures for this um, particular data gathering um, contract because I, I, I had a mate do this um, himself, like a volunteer was able to scrape the data to identify the thousands of Airbnb properties that are being rented across the Brisbane LGA. Like we don't need to spend thousands of dollars to do that sort of thing and identify which properties are Airbnb. We literally just did it with a couple of volunteers and um, a, a bit of IT programming um, skill. And so I, I found it funny that we have to spend a lot of money on identifying these properties. But uh, I, I do think it's probably a, a worthwhile exercise to be a bit more thorough in identifying them. I've um, reported several to the council and, and my greatest disappointment has actually been that the council says Look, the land is zoned for um, the land zoning would permit short-term accommodation here. So even though the building wasn't designed for short-term accommodation, we're going to allow it to continue as a um, as a lawful use. And I think that's disappointing. And through you, Chair, to Councillor Allen, I, I would encourage the city planning team to look into that because I think there's a mistake occurring there, where buildings which weren't designed for short-term accommodation, the council is still allowing them to be used for Airbnb housing if the zoning of that site permits it. And so you, you could literally rent out an old shack or like um, a tin shed on Airbnb. And as long as it's in the particular zoning for mixed use or a zoning that allows short-term accommodation, Brisbane City Council is allowing that tin shed to be rented out on Airbnb. So there's a clear problem there in terms of how the city plan interacts with the enforcement and the um, building compliance frameworks, etc. Turning to item D, I have been uh, held and expressed concerns about this project for quite some time and those concerns were only amplified today when um, we heard about the, the impacts that this resumption will have on uh, at least one family and, and how poorly City Projects has gone about negotiating land resumptions. It's interesting reading the business case where um, in evaluating the costs and benefits of the project, the business case itself suggests that objections to land resumptions are, are not particularly likely. And, and in, in making that assumption, that, that factors into the cost-benefit analysis of the project as a whole. So city projects and whoever's put this business together, case together, they're saying, oh, well, the project is worth doing and the benefits outweigh the costs. And one of the reasons that keeps the costs down is that the um, the, there won't be strong objections to land resumptions. That's in the business case. Um, turns out there are strong objections to the, um, land resumptions, and that's going to have an impact uh, on the timelines of the project. It's going to drag things out. But I, I can say for the record that uh, the Greens don't support this project, and, and it, if we did have balance of power in the chamber, we would do everything we could to stop it proceeding in its current form. I acknowledge that some improvements to the local road network are necessary, but I don't think a wholesale 
widening of Priestdale Road is necessary. I think there are other options that should have been great, given greater con consideration. And in particular, the business case uh, doesn't talk about alternatives such as improving local public transport services to take people out of their cars. The traffic modelling essentially says, OK, there are this many more people moving into the area, therefore there are going to be this many more cars on the local road network, therefore we have to widen the road. Rather than saying, look, there are more people moving into the area, but we could put more bus, bus routes on and that would mean not quite so many people have to drive. But the council's own business case doesn't explore those alternative options. It simply says we have to widen the road. Uh, and I think that's a great shame. I think it means the council is wasting money on an unnecessary project. I, um, yeah, I empathise with the residents who are losing a pretty significant chunk of their home. It's like their entire yard, basically. It's not a particularly long property. Uh, and I'm also concerned about the ve vegetation that's being removed because there are quite a few large trees, I would describe them as significant trees, in the front yard that are being removed as part of this ro road widening or as part of this resumption. And I think it's a great shame um, that probably the, the greenest yard in that little precinct is going um, to be denuded of trees. Uh, I guess I'd also just remind the administration that the um, the long-term future of our city is not car-based transport. The long-term future for our city, particularly in the outer burbs, is to be improving public and active transport connections. And we can do that without widening roads, and we can do that without resuming more properties. So, I, yeah, I'm, I'm very disappointed the council in, insists on proceed, proceeding with this re resumption. I think there are viable alternatives. I, I don't think the project is necessary. I don't support it. And, um, if I had the power to do so, I would um, pull funding from this project. I did also have a question for the chamber, which is how, how many people in this chamber have actually read all the documents for Clause D? Could we have a show of hands? How many people have read all 150 pages of that document? Uh, I, I see Councillor McLaughlin put his hand up. <laughs> Do, he seems to suggest he actually read all 150 pages. I'm impressed. Good on you. Um, I haven't. And I suspect that the vast majority of councillors in this chamber have not read all the documents relating to item D and, and the resumption. So what's happening here is that councillors are voting on whether to resume part of a person's home without even taking the time to read the objection from the owner, without taking their time to familiarise themselves properly with the documentation. So I, I think that's pretty concerning from a process perspective. The, the Land Act, the acquisitions process, presumes that local governments will be making an informed decision about whether land acquisitions are absolutely necessary and whether there genuinely aren't any alternatives and whether the benefits outweigh the, the costs and negative impacts to residents. Uh, but here we have a whole room full of city councillors who are voting on whether or not to resume um, part of someone's home without even having read all the documents. That's, I think, a very concerning process that undermines the legitimacy of the acquisition itself and raises serious concerns about whether due process has been properly followed. So, uh, yeah, I, I hope that acquisition doesn't go ahead. I hope the council sees common sense and realises down the track that it's not worth the money and it's not worth the hassle and it's not worth the delays to the overall project of having a long protracted dispute with the relevant residents in court. Um, finally, just on the question of rooming accommodation, I think this highlights the difficulty of centralised regulation and, um, and nuanced city planning that meets a uh, complex city's needs. Because, to be honest, there are some areas where we do need to be a little bit more flexible and generous in terms of how rooming accommodation is defined. I was interested to hear Councillor Johnson's comments, because I know of many share houses in her el electorate, not rooming accommodation, but share houses that have a single lease, that have more than five unrelated adults. So there might be six or seven people living in a five-bedroom house, and that's how they keep their rent affordable, and, and that's how they, they live in, um, in the inner south side. But the room and accommodation definitions as they currently stand actually make that kind of uh, dwelling uh, unlawful or in violation of the sea plan. And I fell foul of this myself several years ago. Um, basically, I had to move out of my home because the, uh, the city plan said that I couldn't live with my friends anymore. And that was really crappy, that really sucked. And so I think in that respect, this change that the state government is bringing in actually has some positive benefits. It's going to uh, facilitate a more flexible approach to share housing. I think the difference, and 
Um, I would suggest to the Chair of City Planning and to the Lord Mayor that this is something that could be looked at in, in future if you are proposing to have a more nuanced definition of re rooming accommodation, is that there is a significant difference between a household that has a single lease where there are maybe six or seven people renting out that place versus a rooming accommodation that has many different leases for many different rooms. And that's the distinction Councillor, we need to drill down into in terms of that your definition. Time has expired. Thank you. Any further debate? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I rise to speak on items B and C. And for my colleagues on this side of the chamber, I think they will um, be very uh, aware of what I'm going to be speaking on. In particular, um, in item C, it's uh, the subsection item 15. And in item, uh, sorry, um, sorry, item six, sorry. And in item B, it's item one. And they both relate to the Wadeville Street um, project, which is certainly a very important one. So we've had stage 1A, which was um, the Wadeville Ritchie Road intersection, which was outside the Polara State School. But stage 1B is on Wadeville Street, where it intersects with Parkwood Drive. Now, this is a very important intersection for the suburbs of Heathwood and Polara, and particularly over the last three years, there has been substantial growth throughout both of those suburbs. And we've also had a lot of new residents move into the area. So they've come from areas outside the city of Brisbane and we do welcome them to our local community. But with this growth, we are also upholding the responsibility. We all know in this place that it is not easy to manage the infrastructure where there is a situation of rapid growth because sometimes a suburb can grow much, much faster than the pace of the infrastructure. And I do say that there has been, through um, the amendments that have come through in the LGIP and the LTIP, so there's been a fast tracking of over $29 million worth of infrastructure, but importantly, on the Wadeville Ritchie Corridor project, stages 1A and 1B, the council officers did a significant amount of work supporting what I was advocating and ensuring that the documentation, the business case, the designs were all prepared and submitted to the federal government through the LRCI. Now, the Local Roads and Community Infrastructure Grant came through for these two stages, 1A and 1B, and we are, in the local community, extraordinarily grateful for that support and that funding from the federal government to ensure that our council projects that we can deliver on the ground are delivered sooner for our local community. And the reason this is so important is because it enhances safety in a school precinct. Now, in item C, we have the actual awarding of the contract to Doval, and that is over $3.8 million. And in item B, we have the APA relocation costs. So, for those of you who are not aware, we've had the oil and gas pipelines that run pretty much right through the centre of my ward. And quite a number of years ago, we had the oil pipeline burst over at Algester, and that oil pipeline has now been drained, but we still have the APA gas pipeline. And because a lot of those underground services are right in the immediate corridor of where we need to do these road improvements, it is vitally important that we get this moving. Now, when I was out at Polara State School yesterday afternoon for their school leaders induction, it was lovely to see that the construction team is on site and through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Wines, they have set up their construction zone. They have started um, working on, there's a big island that comes out that uh, interferes with that smooth flow of the intersection. They have started some of the work on that. There is a lot of work that will be undertaken. And I would like to say to the council officers that are working on this project, a very big thank you for really understanding the important needs of the school to make sure that during school drop-off 
and school pickup, there is no reduction in any of the vehicle lanes to ensure that we have as smooth as possible a flow through that critical peak period of time, but also to make sure that those school students are immediately looked after in that um, time frame, because the last thing we need is heavy equipment going at the same time as when children are walking around. And um, through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Wines, I know that Stage 1A has been well received by the community because there is now that safe pedestrian crossing, that supervised pedestrian crossing for those children to go from Polaris State School and cross on Ritchie Road. So these are the important projects that the Shrina Council is endeavouring to deliver for our local communities. It is not just about projects in the CBD. Whilst they are important and we have our walking connections by projects like the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge that we had the um, presentation and transport committee about this morning, these local projects out in the suburbs, in the southernmost part of this city, are just as equally important to our residents to make sure that these children and their families can get to and from the schools and to and from <coughs> their different places within the suburbs as well. Now, Councillor Wines, through you, Mr Chair, I, I do say that um, one of the other added bonuses of this intersection upgrade is certainly one that uh, Councillor Murphy is well aware that I've been advocating for, and that is the new bus services that are generating through that precinct as well. So we now finally have a Polara bus as a result of a lot of advocacy, and I can say that that 126 service is getting well patronage, and there is also now two Polara State School buses, the 803 and the 804. And having this traffic intersection at Wadeville Street and Parkwood Drive signalised is going to permit a very, very smooth flow of traffic because having that timed regulation of the traffic means that people are able to go through that intersection in a safe, controlled and courteous manner. Now, that is very important when we are talking about school zones, and I think that this is, be, this is a project that we have worked very hard with the officers on. And I would like to place on the record my thanks for all of the officers that have worked on this project and that will continue to work on this project because they, their diligence, their professionalism and their consideration for my local community is absolutely obvious when they come out to meet with the stakeholders. So they've had meetings on site with the school's executive team and can I say that they, are, the school's executive team are very appreciative of the time and effort that the council officers have put into ensuring that the communication process is clear, that the project timelines are explained and any concerns that have been raised have been addressed. So through you, Mr Chair, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the council officers and it's great to have this project kicking off and I fully expect that uh, when we have that turn on of the traffic lights that uh, there will be a lot of people in the community very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Further debate? Councillor Cumming. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll be I'll be fast. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, contract uh, on page four A nine, uh, the George Clayton Park uh, playground at Manly. Incidentally, George was alderman of the area from 1952 to 1967 and started the great 71-year uh, reign of labour in Winter Manly, and I'm sure there'll be many more years to come. Uh, I uh, this. This uh, playground would probably be described as ageing these days, but I reckon it was built first when I was in council, so that was about 25 years ago. Uh, there was talk, well, I was discussed with council officers about what was going to go into the project. There was talk of a second-hand Liberty Swing being available. This, that's the special swing for disabled children, and uh, I understand that is going to be part of the redevelopment. The Lord Mayor's flyer that he put out around the Winter Manly area in recent times does uh, appear to show a Liberty Swing, so that's good. Uh, the other part of the playground needing renewal is the lighthouse, and uh, 
I'll be clean to see whether it's uh, brought up to standard as well. My own children enjoyed the uh, lighthouse when they were young. It's, uh, it's, uh, of course, it's not a real lighthouse. It's a make-believe make lighthouse, and it's got nice views out to, over the bay, and, uh, and it's good exercise climbing up and down the steps inside the, uh, the lighthouse, the staircase in there. Uh, the other contract I wish to refer to is uh, B8 on page 9. Uh, this is a, a very well located playground adjacent to the Wynnum Junior Rugby League leased area and, and, and next to the Wynnum Manly Ward's greatest sporting complex which is Kitchener Park. In uh, my experience playgrounds situated close to sporting fields are heavily utilised as the younger children can play on them whilst their uh, brother or sister are training on the main field next door. I have uh, playgrounds in Wynnum at the Vikings at Aussie Rules Club at Wynnum West, the Wynnum Rugby Union Club and Bayside United Football Club and they've all been great success. I pushed for a flying fox and some exercise equipment to be included as part of this uh, playground upgrade and that is occurring so I look forward to this playground being completed in the near future. Thank you for the speakers. Councillor Fong. Uh, thank you Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item D of the ENC report on uh, Gardner Road ex extension resumption. It seems like a, a no-brainer to me to support further infrastructure investment in a growing suburb like Rochdale. Just as Councillor Wines stated earlier, land resumption can be an unpleasant and uncomfortable part of infrastructure investment in our city. We know it can be very difficult emotional time, especially for those um, long-term residents who have to sacrifice part of their lifestyle for the betterment of our city as a whole. And I sincerely thank those who have contributed to the process. But I wonder how the uh, local Labor state member who has been advocating for road widening and providing more on-street parking for residents will react to Labor's latest attempt to delay and understand they are going to vote against the delivery of road widening to her area. And as for uh, Council 3 Raganathan, I wonder how will your residents feel when they know you move a motion to delay bike infrastructure, construction and investment. And the argument you just used against this item actually fits infrastructure projects, most of the projects in your own ward and which you advocated for. So your arguments today make me feel more comfortable in voting against those projects in the future. Mr Chair, infrastructure investment is important to the growth of our city. And we'll, I will continue to work with the local residents and, of course, with Council Wines in addressing the concerns raised. But I think it is hypocritical and disgraceful for the opposition to play politics over this project of citywide importance. So I urge all, everyone in the chamber to vote for this item. Thank you. Thank you. Further speakers? Council Strunk. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak uh, on Clause A, specifically uh, contracts and tendering um, contract number 12, which is the Casimir Way Park Stage 2 uh, construction of, uh, of, the, of the playground. I wanted to speak on this one, and I have spoken on this one on a couple of occasions, right, but I wanted to um, put some more context to this park and uh, how, it, how important this park is to the, uh, the residents of, uh, of Richland, spe specifically the residents that live along Progress Road uh, through to Garden Road and then from Government Road through to Garden Road. Um, this, uh, this development or, or this uh, playground is going to uh, support um, a large number of uh, units of accommodation, um, uh, uh, medium, uh, medium to low density, um, in other words townhouses basically. Um, now this, uh, this proliferation of townhouses has been happening for well over 10 years along this stretch of road, along Progress Road and, uh, and Government Road. Um, the uh, green space that uh, I, I and, my, and one of my team identified some years ago, uh, we, we thought was just privately owned. We didn't know uh, council even owned it uh, and until, one, until we were driving past one day and I, I said to one of my team, well, what do you think? Uh, Maybe we should check on that before we, before we, uh, when we get back to the office. And we did, and we found it was council. So it was, it was a green light for me in regards to trying to establish a park. Now this will be the only new park in my ward uh, for the last seven years, right? And we've had enormous amount of growth, uh, you know, in Doolandella and Ellen Grove, and of course in Richlands as well. 
And being that this is the only new park, right, um, uh, we, we, it, we just had to treat it with, uh, with the respect that it was due, of course, because we have hundreds and hundreds of families that are now currently living along that corridor, and we will have hundreds and hundreds of more families when the, when the full development of that stretch is uh, realised. Um, I've seen plans for uh, uh, another one just uh, not far away as well, which is all going to be in walking distance of this park. Now I say walking distance because that's the only way you're really going to be able to uh, enjoy this park. Because there will be no parking almost in front of the park or inside the park, right? So this is a walking park, basically. Now, this park, unfortunately, right, will, uh, will not have, and but will need, right, a footpath from, guard, uh, from Government Road down Castlemore Way. Unfortunately, that development of houses along Castlemore Way to that park has no footpath. And of course, the, the road itself is only about seven meters wide. So you can imagine the people that park on that road at nighttime or whatever time through the day is not, is not a lot of safe space for people wanting to walk down to the park when it gets established. There's also missing links along Government Road, right? Um, yes, the developers along Government Road have been making that provision, right? But there's a lot of missing links. So again, we have Government Road, right, which is a rural road, has never been upgraded. We're relying upon developers to do that, right, and they have been doing that. But it doesn't actually have a safe pathway through to this park. And most of the accommodation that is being built or has been built is along Government Road. And there is no other park available for the residents, right? So honestly, when the development that started happening along Progress Road and Government Road started happening well over 10 years ago, there was no provision. There was no provision. And, and what was actually bought, eventually bought, of course, that piece of land, became the provision, but there was no plan to develop it until we came along and said, I want to spend $250,000 putting some playground equipment in this two hectare, two hectare green space. And then all of a sudden, um, council officers became very interested because I was putting some of my SIP funding into that. And then everything happened after that. Now, it's important that we establish parks in those suburbs that are growing and, and not necessarily spending and shouldn't be spending hundreds or tens of millions of dollars establishing or redoing a park like Victoria Park before we do the basics, the basics in the suburbs where the ratepayers live and hundreds of people in my ward are going to use this park once established that will never go to Victoria Park, I'll tell you that right now, or very few of them will, if they even know where it is. Um, so we gotta get, we've gotta start prioritizing the suburbs. And this is the campaign that we've been running is the forgotten suburbs. And every time you turn around and have a look at uh, this sort of a situation with town planning, right, you can see that this administration and previous administration, LNP administrations have been ignoring the suburbs where they should be investing the money of, from the ratepayers who actually pay the money, right? So, and then, and then on top of that, as, uh, as it was mentioned by our, uh, my, the opposition leader, right? We get, we get things like this. And I, and I bring this up because Castmore Way is in here. And we get a, an update, a summer newsletter from the Lord Mayor. You couldn't get a bigger picture than that, right? We get, now, that would have cost thousands of dollars, right? That would have cost thousands of dollars. Honestly, I could have used that money to establish, which is going to be in stage three of this park, for a flying fox and a few other things like a barbecue as well. So I could have used that money. Um, I, we, I already went out online through Facebook and a newsletter, uh, a, 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 um, a newsletter, email-based newsletter as well that I put out, which cost council no money at all, right? Pretty much no money at all. Um, and they already knew about all this stuff that was in the summer, the summer update. So, Honestly, uh, I don't know why 
that had to be done. I could have used the money much more responsibly within this park. Um, and uh, so the park, I guess, as to say, is two hectares. Beautiful um, plan for the park. And we have two, in the, we have at least four stages that we're going to be uh, developing um, through the SIP funding. And if there's some capital works money, that'll be terrific as well. But uh, we need to do more for those for those areas that do not have parks. And Duandela, which is quite near Palara, which is getting a district park, which they deserve, right? But so do the people of Duandela need a decent park. And there's been a small little bit of green space that's uh, just off uh, Redhead Street that we will be developing a park there as well, but it's a very tiny little, probably wouldn't even be an acre of land, right? So, uh, and there's a huge amount of development happening along that Redhead Street and uh, some of the other streets as well. So really we need to invest in the suburbs, right? It doesn't all have to be in the inter-city areas, which is where we see the majority of the money that is uh, invested uh, spent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Further speakers? Okay. Councillor Wise. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. I rise in, uh, to discuss uh, item D of the ENC report, the consideration of the Gardner Road uh, extension project. Uh, it has been discussed at length in this place, but I will make some key points. The Gardner Road proposal will carry up to 14,000 vehicles per day in 2031. Uh, Councillors should recognise the importance of this as a continuation of the work that we've done on Rochdale and Priestdale. Uh, this area is a growing area of the city. We carry uh, a lot of the new subdivisions for standalone dwellings will be in this part of the city. That's why it's necessary to improve infrastructure for it. There was an interesting criticism of the project that uh, it was for motor vehicles it stands as a project that will vastly improve the active transport uh, through that area, the bikeways and walk -it walkways for uh, local residents to be able to use that area. Also, something that's not been touched on is that uh, this is a necessary response to some of the closures that the state government in particular have brought in around the, the closure of School Road and other works around the South East Freeway and also the Metro work. So this road work is actually in many ways a response to the needed improvements for our metro system, a mass public transport system, and it massively improves the active transport. But I noticed that uh, those things can be easily dismissed when it's convenient for some members of the uh, crossbenchers. And I find that really disappointing because you want people to engage in a meaningful uh, way and for them to be consistent in the way that they view uh, projects. That when a person was to claim that they support active and public transport, they would but rather uh, because it's convenient and easy and because they can look a person in uh, the, the eye and say that they're on their side, that they turn 180. Um, and I think it's an important to reflect on how easy it is for opposition and crossbench, crossbench councillors to take the easy path, uh, and something that they do too often. But it, if you believe in improvements of public transport, if you believe in improvements to active transport, and if you believe that normal people have a right to move around the way that they choose, then I think you should support this project. It's that simple. Uh, it is necessary to connect the outer southeast. Councillor Strunk makes a fine point about expenditure in the outer suburbs. I hope that he takes the spirit of his comments about parklands and reflects them upon this, this roadway needed for an equivalent, his southwestern area, an equivalently distanced place from the centre of the city in the southeast. Uh, the uh, public speaker, I have a great deal of sympathy for her circumstances. Uh, and as a result, I wanted just to table some documents just so that councillors understand what is being discussed. So I table uh, the concept proposal for the, for the uh, Gardner Road extension and the connections through Priestdale. Thank you. I also uh, table an aerial view of the land proposed for resumption, which indicates that the new boundary for the White family home will be consistent with the other rear boundaries of their neighbours. It also shows uh, that in the past we have gone around their property, but to have a, a proper roadway and a proper active transport link in particular, the land identified uh, does stand out from the other properties and means that active transport cannot be an option if the land is not uh, resumed. 
Thank you. Uh, and this is a final uh, uh, piece of paper that indicates the approximate location of the new back fence. So I just wanted those to be submitted for consideration for councillors so that uh, people had a better understanding of what it was we're talking about. I, I, as I say, we have engaged with the White family in a, in a way that we would ordinarily do. We are consistently uh, generous and forward in our dealings about uh, resumption. Uh, as I say, it's an unpleasant part of infrastructure programs and I, uh, I empathise greatly with their circumstances. Uh, however, if we are going to have a, a transport system in all three senses, whether it be private vehicle, public vehicle or personal active, the land, um, if it's not resumed, the project really can't proceed in an active transport sense or it becomes very dangerous for active transport users. And that, is one of, and that should be an important consideration. It also vastly reduces the effectiveness of the, uh, the private motor vehicle proposal. So can I ask councillors to be consistent in the principles with which they ordinarily would stand in this place, uh, rather than take the easy way uh, and support... Order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Sri Ranganathan. Will Councillor Wines take a question? No. Councillor Wines will take a question? No. And support, uh, support this proposal that will do so much for the outer south east and be an important part of our entire transport network. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on items E and F and uh, just to kick off. Item E. Um, item E is amendments to two planning scheme policies associated with the local government infrastructure plan, the infrastructure design plan scheme policy and the transport access parking and servicing planning scheme policy. As the Lord Mayor said, both planning scheme policies cover a broad range of design standards and requirements for trunk infrastructure, including parks, roads and drainage, as well as infrastructure handed back uh, over to council as assets. Mr Chair, you may recall in November last year, Council undertook its five yearly review of our local government infrastructure plan, and as such, these amendments are required to ensure our policies and design standards align with that review. This includes upgrading the specifications for parks, including ninja course embellishments, revised standards for dog off leash areas, and electronic barbecues as the preferred type of barbecue. We have also clarified car parking and active transport requirements such as bike racks for the range of park types across Brisbane. As the Lord Mayor indicated, we have bolstered the requirements for shade provision in our playgrounds in line with industry best practice. And this will ensure our planning scheme and anyone who may undertake works on our playgrounds are aware of our commitments to shade all of, shading all of our playgrounds over the next three years. It is proposed that consultation on these policy changes will be undertaken in line with the consultation from both LGIP and LTIP, which is anticipated to occur later this year. And uh, to Councillor Cassidy's point, um, consultation of the LGIP and LTIP amendment package will not be delayed. Uh, it is still with the state government for the state's first interest check. The state's KPI meant that a response was due to council on the 23rd of January, and to date we have not received a response. Um, moving on to item F, the uh, minor amendment package M. Uh, in December, the state made further changes to the uh, planning regulation, specifically to, uh, to rooming accommodation. And uh, while well, Councillor Johnston isn't in the room, she made much of council working hand in glove with the state on this particular matter. Now, the reality is that the state made the changes to the scheme without any uh, warning and without any consultation with local governments across Queensland. And in fact, on the 2nd of December 2022, we re received a letter from the state about this particular um, planning regulation change. And uh, guess when it became effective? On the 2nd of December, the same day we got the letter. So look, you know, that's not really working hand in glove and we would have liked to have been consulted on this. But at any rate, uh, any change to the planning regulation by the state government requires significant time and resources to both understand and implement the change and uh, reflect them in Council's planning scheme. Uh, it is disappointing the Council was not part of the review process, especially when changes such as these can and will have significant impacts on our community and our local streets. 
impacts such as safety, fire hazards and amenity concerns like car parking, waste and refuse collection are some of those concerns. As these regulations override any council local planning scheme, a minor administrative amendment is required to ensure our city plan maintains its currency and effectiveness. According to the state, the amendment is intended to streamline approvals for rooming accommodation to provide greater housing diversity in the low density residential zone, the low medium density residential zone and general residential zones across uh, Queensland. And it was rather interesting to note Councillor Cassidy's uh, comments on this particular item because um, these particular changes are way more significant than the changes to the, to the overlays and he actually made no comment whatsoever on this particular change. Um, in terms of the, where we go with this now, um, this um, will give rise to an update to city plan and will be required to refine the regulation of small scale rooming accommodation and dwelling houses in low density residential zones and provide statewide consistency in relation to the types of housing expected within residential zones. Um, we will also allow for small scale rooming accommodation uses that do not require planning approval, such as a material change of use in low density residential zones where certain requirements can be met. And uh, will also enable council to require a planning approval for dwelling house developments in the high density residential zone and me medium density residential zone. So in essence, um, those zones that already are targeted for medium and high density, any changes there would require a council approval, but uh, where they're occurring in low density uh, residential zones and low medium residential zones, there's no requirement for, uh, for council to, to approve those. Um, further, under this minor administrative amendment, there has also been updates to zoning and overlay maps to reflect current development approvals and recent ministerial infrastructure designations. It is proposed that the amended planning scheme changes will take effect from the 10th of March 2023 when city plan is next updated. And I commend both these items to the chamber. Yeah. Sorry, I was just getting a hand signal. That was, what was that? Sorry. No, that's that's, seri that's separately seriatim. So I'll, for the record, items A, B, C, and E. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Strunk. Eyes to the right, noes to the left. Thanks, Billy. Please close the bars. Clarks, have we got a result? Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour, one against and six abstentions. Thank you. Councillors, please resume your seats. We're now voting, councillors, as you resume your seats on item D in the recommendations report for adoption. All those in favour of item D, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. A division to be called by Councillor Cook and Councillor Johnson. Please ring the bells, eyes to the right, nose to the left.
Okay. Thanks, Billy. Please close the bars. Clark, have we got a result? Mr. Please Chair. Silence, please. Mr. Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour and 7 against. Thank you. Declare that carried. Councillors, please resume your seats. We're now voting on item F. Item F, in the recommendations report for adoption, ENC report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by councillors Johnson and Cook. Please ring the bells, eyes to the right, nose to the left. Thanks, Billy. Please close the bars. Clarks, result, please. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour, one against and six abstentions. Thank you. Declare that item carried. Please resume your seats, councillors. Lord Mayor, Establishment and Coordination Committee decisions, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, item A is the Carbon Neutral Council Emissions Reduction Strategy uh, oh, and also Council's... Captain Lord Mayor, first you have to move it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me start again. I move that the report setting out the decisions of the Establishment and Coordination Committee as Delegate of Council during the summer recess 2022-23 on matters usually considered by that committee are noted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor and seconded by the Deputy Mayor that the report setting out the decisions of the Establishment and Coordination Committee as delegate of the Council during the summer recess 2022-23 on matters usually considered by that committee be noted. Lord Mayor, is there any debate? <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, so, as I was about to say, uh, item A is the Carbon Neutral Council Emissions Reduction Strategy and also Council's 2021-22 annual report to the Australian Government's Climate Active Carbon Neutral Program. Now, uh, we're very proud of Council's carbon neutral status as certified by Climate Active, an uh, agency of the Commonwealth Government. Uh, and uh, we're also very proud uh, that going beyond carbon neutral, uh, we are now striving uh, towards a carbon emission reduction of more than 30% um, by the time the Olympic Games come around. Now, uh, this is something that uh, our emissions reduction target and strategy uh, is on par and in lockstep with the Queensland Labor Government's emission reduction strategy. So um, it'll be interesting to hear what Labor councillors say about that target and that strategy, given it's the same target uh, that the state Labor Government has. Um, but there are some differences that I need to point out. Uh, first of all, not one single government department in the Queensland Government is carbon neutral. The Queensland Government itself is not carbon neutral. Now, if you would ask yourself, a government that is serious about climate action surely would be taking climate action. What would be one of the first things that they would do? Make their departments, even just some of the departments, carbon neutral. And so, I went to a, a search to identify whether any government departments in the Queensland Labor government um, are either carbon neutral or on the path to being carbon neutral as certified by Climate Active. And you know what I could find? Zero. None. But you'll be pleased to know that the Department of Environment plans to be carbon neutral by 2030. Oh. Not next year, not this year. Not even five years time, but 2030. So the Department of Environment in the Labor State Government plans to be carbon neutral as certified by Climate Active by 2030. Wow. Wow. Now, adding on to this, I've, I've, I've made it very clear in the past, I get really frustrated by people who grandstand and say, oh, we should be doing more, and then not doing anything. And you'll remember that there was a series of virtue signalling motions put forward in councils all around Australia 
of declaring a climate emergency. Remember that? Yes. And it was like, oh, if you don't declare an emergency, you obviously don't care. And we're like, yeah, been there, done that. We've moved on. We're actually doing something. Well, I went back and had a look at the Climate Active website to work out how many councils around Australia had declared a climate emergency and then how many have actually become carbon neutral. So, uh, in New South Wales, for example, uh, yeah, 38 councils declared a climate emergency. Uh, There's a similar number in Victoria. Uh, in Queensland, there were two councils that declared a climate emergency. I will point out that neither of those councils are carbon neutral. So they declared an emergency and then did absolutely nothing to make their own operations carbon neutral. Now, if you go to the Climate Active website and you search for um, city councils um, and determine how many councils around Australia are, climate, uh, are certified in the Climate Active program as carbon neutral, you get less than 15. There are 500 local governments in, in the whole of Australia. 500 less than 15 are certified as carbon neutral. And a whole lot more declared climate emergencies. I mean, really. You can say you care about something or you can actually do something about it. And, and these guys laugh because their friends up the road say they care, they set a target and they've done nothing. Can't even get one department, not even the environment department is carbon neutral. So let's find out which councils in Australia are carbon neutral. Brisbane City Council, the City of Yarra, the City of Sydney, the City of Subiaco in WA, City of Melbourne, City of Darabin, City of Adelaide, Bayside City Council, the City of Logan. Congratulations, Logan. They are the second Queensland Council to become carbon neutral. And guess what? They, didn't declare it, did, they did not declare a climate emergency either. They just got on and did it. Um, so congratulations, Mayor Darren Power and the Logan City Council for becoming second city in Australia, uh, sorry, in Queensland to be carbon neutral. There's also Maroonda City Council, the City of Mooney Valley and Moorland City Council. That's all I could find out of 500 local governments. Really, it's actually quite disappointing. So we will continue not only to make our operations carbon neutral as certified by this national agency, uh, but we will strive to reduce our emissions by more than 30% by the time the Olympic Games comes around. Now, uh, that's gonna take a lot of effort across every range, every uh, area of council. Now, one of the key things that we're working on at the moment is dealing with Minister Bailey about making sure that our transport fleet can uh, be zero tailpipe emission vehicles going forward. And we're looking forward to uh, progress in that respect. We're also gearing up our food and organics recycling program, which is already available in 6,000 households. Uh, and we're looking forward to expanding that. And this is over and above our major programs to increase recycling, to reduce food waste, uh, to also to reduce the emissions of council facilities and also to generate green power. And so not only have we made our facilities more energy efficient, uh, we've also installed a whole range of solar arrays on the roof. Uh, we generate green electricity by capturing and burning to create green power, landfill gases uh, from a number of sites across the city. Uh, and there's a whole range of initiatives uh, that have seen us already at this point in time uh, reduce our emissions as an organisation by 20,000 tonnes. 20,000 tonnes. And so to put it in perspective, already where we're at, and that's not even, that's not even looking at the big 30% reductions that we'll get going forward, uh, that's equivalent to taking uh, 4,300 cars off the road. Uh, so these are the emission reductions we've already achieved. Uh, but obviously, uh, when it comes to becoming carbon neutral, it comes to net zero, uh, you reduce your emissions and the emissions that you can't reduce or haven't reduced, you offset. Uh, this is global practice. Uh, this is not something uh, that is somehow questioned 
this is the way it is done. You reduce your emissions and the emissions that have not been reduced or are remaining are offset. And how do you offset them? You accept that we live in a global environment. We accept that emission reductions in Australia are important, but so are emission reductions around the world. And particularly someone living in a situation of poverty in another part of the world being given the opportunity to have renewable power supplies is important. Uh, and so uh, it is important that we treat this as a global issue, which is what it is. Uh, and uh, we have a range of both local offsets and international offsets acknowledging that uh, there is a global market for offsets. Uh, we also make sure uh, that uh, we don't invest in uh, offsets that might be questionable. We don't invest in offsets uh, that you know, we can't guarantee are, um, are being made appropriate, appropriately. And so um, I can confirm that we do not buy offsets from land-based carbon abatement projects outside of Australia. These are ones that have had question marks raised about them. We do not buy those. Uh, we do not purchase offsets from Vera. But in fact, uh, we simply trade other offsets on a platform provided by Vera. Uh, so we're not buying offsets from Vera. We're simply using their platform to trade offsets. Uh, so uh, this is something that we'll continue to monitor and, and manage going forward. And uh, obviously, uh, we'll continue to strive to reduce our emissions as a city. It's something that we should all be very proud of. We're one of less than 15 councils in Australia to be certified as carbon neutral. But that is not enough. We are striving for massive emission reductions going forward. And I, I can tell you, Adelaide City Council is carbon neutral. Good on them. They have 25,000 residents. The City of Adelaide has 25,000 residents. Uh, in fact, the City of Sydney has 215,000 residents. Uh, there is nothing of our scale in local government that is carbon neutral. Uh, we will continue to be carbon neutral. We will continue to strive for massive well, reductions. Your time has expired. Further debate, Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thanks very much, Chair. That was more uh, fantastical than Alice in Wonderland, uh, that little story there. It's an embarrassment to the people of Brisbane to have uh, this policy and this Lord Mayor uh, claiming, claiming that we are in fact carbon neutral when there are so many question marks now, so many question marks about using carbon offsets to simply claim carbon neutrality. We, of course, support the um, targets. Um, I don't know what the Lord Mayor thought I'd get up and say, oh, we don't support the same target as the state government because they're proposing it. Of course we support those emissions reductions targets. We just don't have any faith that you will get us there, Lord Mayor. Uh, because this fancy report that's before us today, a nice glossy report, doesn't change the fact that uh, the only way in which you are uh, achieving carbon neutrality is by purchasing um, overseas carbon credits using millions of dollars of ratepayers' money to, um, to use to purchase carbon credits in China and India and other places as well. Um, that's bad enough, but we're now seeing these reports that um, the carbon offsets provi provided by Vera, the company that this LNP administration uses, are potentially phantom credits and don't represent genuine carbon reductions. Now, the Lord Mayor's just claimed well, he doesn't, his administration doesn't purchase any of Vera, he just uses the platform and they're the intermediary, I guess, in, in which they purchase them from. And uh, they then uh, provide paperwork in a tick and flick exercise to Climate Active which then certifies council as carbon neutral. Uh, um, one did wonder whether the Lord Mayor watched Four Corners last night. Um, he might not have had time. I do suggest uh, that he does watch that program because um, there are some startling uh, information in that program given by former uh, employees of Climate Active about their approach uh, to verifying uh, the um, carbon credits purchased through platforms like Vera. Uh, there are no eyes on the ground. Uh, there are actually no mechanisms to ensure that overseas purchased carbon credits are genuine carbon credits. Now, the Lord Mayor can stand up and wave his arms around and say, this is a Commonwealth platform and, and you know, oh, well, everyone uses this platform. I'm sure, he can say that, but he cannot guarantee. He's claiming that this, administration, that this council 
um, uh, under his administration is carbon neutral, whether it's through the Climate Active platform or the Vera platform or any other platform that his administration uses to purchase overseas carbon credits, there is no guarantee uh, that those carbon credits are genuine. That's been, that's been laid bare now, um, and I suggest that he looks at that investigative report that Four Corners did uh, last night, because that is going to raise a whole lot of questions about whether the Brisbane City Council is genuinely carbon neutral. Now, we know this is um, uh, all about greenwashing. The uh, Lord Mayor is terribly worried about what's going to happen in March next year. Um, but we, we warned years ago, we warned years ago that if you don't have eyes on those projects, then you really can't ensure those claims are true. Um, if those carbon credits are generated locally here in Australia and you can see the tangible benefits of um, those schemes, then sure you can. Um, but many of those projects are uncovered by The Guardian uh, recently and Four Corners last night uh, are in fact accelerating um, accelerating carbon emissions through their actions. Um, but each time Labor raised concerns that simply purchasing carbon credits to offset emissions was lazy, a very lazy LNP approach and fraught with danger, and instead we needed to find local solutions, the LNP laughed it off. Um, well, the evidence now is very clear. Um, being lazy can't be an option anymore for Brisbane uh, if we want to be genuinely carbon neutral. Um, greenwashing by purchasing carbon credits won't cut it anymore. Uh, this report confirms something we've known for a very long time, Chair, uh, that diverting organic waste from landfill is clearly not on the priority list for this LNP Council. Um, we know that that is the single most effective way for a Council to reduce emissions. This report uh, makes that very clear. Uh, but what it doesn't make clear is what Council is going to do to reduce emissions, to reduce the burden on ratepayers having to buy overseas carbon credits to achieve genuine carbon neutrality. Um, practices and technology in transport, construction and energy use obviously must play a part in reducing our carbon footprint, and not just this organisation as Council's carbon footprint, but also the residents of Brisbane's carbon footprint. But the only way to reduce emissions um, for every single resident that lives in Brisbane, and it is something we can all do together collectively, is FOGO, food organics, garden organics, organic recycling on an industrial scale, whatever we want to call it. Um, we need to get organic material out of landfill. Uh, we also know that there are more than 70 councils. It's heading well towards 100 councils probably now around Australia, and many here in Queensland that are rolling out a genuine organic recycling system in their cities. Um, it creates local jobs, generates local carbon credits, and reduces fees and charges for residents. Um, but we know that um, this LNP Mayor, Adrian Schrinner, and his LNP Council are definitely not serious about FOGO because the, the papers before us today prove that. Um, they're not serious about diverting 80,000 tonnes of organic material from landfill each and every year. The report says that in the last five years, some 182,000 tonnes of organic waste was diverted from landfill thanks to residents. Um, out in the suburbs of Brisbane, who took the opportunity to have a green garden waste bin at home. That, that accounted for that diversion of organic material going into landfill. But what this report doesn't say is that during that same period, 400,000 tonnes of other organic material was deposited into landfill um, to rot and to emit dangerous gases into the atmosphere. Uh, this LNP administration is not serious about a Brisbane first approach to cutting emissions and achieving genuine carbon neutrality. Uh, you don't uh, have to believe us when we say that, that they're not genuine in their approach to a Brisbane-based carbon neutral approach. Uh, you, you can just believe the report that's before us today. It lays it out uh, in black and white. Uh, emissions reduction strategies listed in the waste management section don't mention FOGO or organic recycling on a citywide scale or whatever term you want to use for FOGO once. It doesn't mention it. It simply says that this administration is going to continue on in a business as usual approach to organic waste management. What they're currently doing now, which is Nothing. It's not good enough what they're doing now, but they're going to continue to just do the same thing and hope for a different result. Um, they say they will also continue to do uh, um, work with council staff to contribute to a zero waste 
ambition. I think that's the only sort of new new thing that's going to be happening uh, in the waste management space in, in achieving carbon neutrality. Uh, so the LNP, we know from their actions, have um, personal ambition, a lot of personal ambition themselves, but it's clear uh, when you look to the future of Brisbane as a city. They have no ambition for the people of Brisbane. Um, they have no plan for the future. They are, um, you know, this is a great example of why the LNP in Brisbane City Council are the very definition of conservative in a political sense. Continue to do the same thing. Uh, they, they, their, their approach in, they see a problem on the horizon, so they window dress a bit to sort of make out like they're doing something, but they really don't want to change. They're resistant to change. They like how it was before. They don't want to deal with problems that are facing our city. Um, and I guess the Courier Mail was absolutely dead on. I don't always agree with the Courier Mail, but they were dead on uh, when they described Schrinner as a strong conservative voice here in Brisbane. Uh, he and his administration uh, is now very much a relic of the past. Uh, you can't bring this document to council today and say, oh, look at the LNP, they're the, they're the teals of Brisbane, they're the clean, green, sustainable team. They absolutely aren't. They're not serious about the challenges facing the residents of Brisbane for decades to come. If they were serious, uh, they'd be talking about uh, spending ratepayers' money, investing in industries here in Brisbane that support jobs, reduce emissions and reduce fees and charges for residents, but instead they will say, nothing to see here, let's just buy some overseas carbon credits uh, and that'll do. Uh, well, unfortunately, Lord Mayor, that won't do for the people of Brisbane. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on item A, the uh, Council Carbon Neutral Emissions Reduction Strategy and Council's annual report to the Australian Government's Carbon Neutral Program. Um, I agree with many of the things that the opposition leader has just said, um, namely that Brisbane City Council is continuing to do the same thing. Uh, and they're definitely not getting good outcomes uh, for the people of Brisbane. I just want people at home to understand what we're actually talking about here, because the Lord Mayor stands up and says Brisbane's carbon neutral city. That's, that's not actually true. That is not true. Brisbane City Council Proprietary Limited, um, the corporation, um, has bought a bunch of offsets and done a few other things, and the council corporation is carbon neutral, um, and, and even that's debatable, but we'll get to that, not the city of Brisbane. Now, the big issue that we have here is, in cities all over the world, councils are leading change within the communities that they represent. This Lord Mayor and this council are not doing that. And for as long as I've been here, they've talked about the same, the same thing, which is, we'll buy some credits, We'll put a few solar panels on the roof of um, the council buildings. Um, we'll buy a few buses that are, are you know, a bit better for the environment. And, and oh, street lights, but they've got the money from the feds to do that. That's pretty much it. Um, composting is largely being kicking and screaming. And it's interesting to hear the Lord Mayor saying he's going to roll it out more. Because it's not like he's been talking to the community about that or to council or to us. Um, so it is, it's, it's very interesting to hear some of these things. What the LNP has fundamentally failed to do, and this is after being in this council, controlling this council fully for nearly two decades, is recognise that there is a leadership, a policy and a practical role here for Council the Corporation to help Brisbane City, the people who live in it, become uh, reduce their energy consumption, uh, to offset their carbon emissions, to reduce their energy use uh, and to generally make a contribution to reducing carbon emissions that is the objective of all three levels of government in Australia. Now there might be a little disagreement here and there about what that should be, but we are all agreed we need to reduce um, our energy use, we need to uh, improve the way in which we manage 
um, carbon offsets. This council fundamentally doesn't do this. Now, I've stood up and said this several times over the last few years, and you know, I, I don't think the LNP will actually listen to me, but this is where council should be going. Um, buying a few carbon offsets uh, absolutely is not getting the job done. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about what's actually in this report as well. Um, the first thing uh, that's in here, in the Lord Mayor, um, the Lord Mayor made a big point about saying we don't buy any emissions from um, Vera. Um, well, I don't know what the Lord Mayor is looking at, but his report that is uh, put forward um, clearly Vera is being used as the broker for uh, carbon offsets. Now, I did not see Four Corners, but I am familiar with the Guardian article. Um, and their investigation, which indicated that up to 90 per cent of all of Vera's um, carbon reduction projects were possibly worthless or phantom credits. 90 per cent. Now, this is the organisation from whom Council is purchasing the bulk of their carbon credits. Um, there is a massive problem with that. Uh, so this council not only has failed the city of Brisbane, and that's its residents, to work with them, um, because that's the objective here. If by 2032 we want to have a green city, that does not mean to a single person outside this room, the corporation sitting up there on George Street, it means the people based in the city, the householders, the businesses, uh, the retailers, um, the sporting clubs, all of those people. Um, this council's view of what is considered to be carbon neutral is too narrow, and that is what needs to change. Um, we should be looking at things, and I've said this many times before as well. Um, when I first started in this council, you got a, a, a rebate for having a water tank. We're going to go into another drought, and there's nothing like that. When I started here in council, you got energy um, efficiency devices in your household. Council came out and helped you reduce your household energy emissions. We're not doing anything like that. Um, this council doesn't contribute to solar power and solar projects. Uh, and the Lord Mayor will stand up and say, oh, this is all to do with uh, other levels of government. It's not. It's not. The Lord Mayor wants to stand up and say, we're a carbon neutral city. No, we're not. It's a carbon neutral corporation that's buying dodgy offsets from a discredited uh, broker. That's what's going on here. Not actually helping this city to become carbon neutral, which is a great goal, a great goal. Um, we should be looking at planning changes. Um, yes, council has to work with the state, um, but the fact that new homes, new apartments can be built um, that do not include energy efficiency measures water reticulation and reuse as standard, um, solar power as standard in any new homes being built is just outrageous. And again, the state and council have a role to play here. Um, these little boxes are getting built in the suburbs and often there's not even, it's not even meeting the basic requirements that are in city plan now, um, which uh, you know, is to allow breezes through you know, two different accesses in the apartments. You know, I've got apartments being built that, that don't have external windows. It's just crazy, crazy. Um, you, you, you don't see any apartments. Now council's allowing rooftop terraces, even in low to medium density areas. Um, where are the solar panels gonna go? They can't go on the roof. Uh, so there are massive problems with the way in which this council is approaching planning to make sure we get well-built homes that can uh, meet the um, environmental needs of our city. Um, and that means weathering drought as well as weathering floods. Um, trees is another big one. I mean, this administration loves to talk up how it's planted two million trees. It will never, ever report on how many trees it cuts down every single day. This council is not even replacing the number of trees that it removes. Um, there are no protections for trees on private property and we see the first thing that any developer does when they buy a block is knock down every single tree on that block. Um, council should be looking at more and innovative ways to protect trees on both public property and private property and that is not being done. Um, we need to look at planting more trees. 
Uh, this council's given up in my area. Oh, I'm sorry, councillor, you've got uh, contaminated land. We couldn't possibly plant a tree there. Um, well, that contaminated land is all over the city. And what's this administration doing about looking at innovative ways to actually uh, plant out, decontaminate, um, and to green up these areas? Absolutely nothing. Now, this administration is getting it wrong. Claiming that you have a carbon neutral city uh, when you are buying dodgy offsets um, from a discredited company uh, is not carbon neutrality. It's not leadership and it's not what this city needs. Uh, you know, I, I don't profess to be the greenest person uh, going and, and have all the solutions on this, but there are simple practical things that we should be doing, without question. And water is one of the biggest ones. Um, look at the storms we've had today. All this water is running off. Stormwater harvesting systems should be standard in any new major buildings. Uh, solar power should be standard in any uh, major new buildings. Uh, we should be looking at vegetation. I mean, this administration's got rid of setbacks altogether, so you can't even plant a tree anywhere. Um, you know, you can't get them to um, to look in the planning solution. You know, the courts now basically say landscaping can also be driveway, it can also be open space, uh, and there's less room for trees on most blocks uh, in the city as well. So look, I, I think this is an exercise in greenwashing. I don't think the council is getting this right. And I think that the Lord Mayor is trying to bamboozle people into thinking this city is doing something positive on reducing our carbon emissions, which is a commendable goal when they're not. And I'll leave, I'll leave everybody with uh, just a couple of figures from the report itself. Um, the report says, and I'm on page 12, over the six years that council has tracked its emissions. Year one, uh, when it went to year two, they went up. Year three, it went down. Year four, it went up. Year five, it went down. Year six, which is the year they're reporting on, it actually went up. Council so Johnson, your time has up, expired. Are there any down. further speakers? Sorry, Councillor. Yes. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item A. As the previous Environment Chair, the Schrinner Council's ongoing commitment to not only carbon neutrality but also to meaningful and long-term emission reduction is something that I'm proud to support and proud to talk about today. You see, critics present these outcomes as a binary choice, Mr Chair. Don't offset emissions, just reduce them. But Mr Chair, in Council we are actually doing both and I'm really proud of that. We do have the runs on the board, Mr Chair. The fact that we are even here today talking about this in the Chamber shows that this is clearly very important for the administration. We not only have our carbon neutral disclosures report but also our detailed carbon emission reduction strategy. Council has a sophisticated approach to accounting our footprint and also the ways that we can reduce it. We've achieved a 7% reduction in emissions. And about two years ago, Mr Chair, we employed the services of Mr Craig Rucastle to launch the Brisbane Carbon Calculator. This is a very practical initiative that this administration has introduced to help residents understand exactly what their emissions are and the simple steps that they can take every single day to help reduce their emissions. We use 100% renewable energy for our buildings and our facilities and we have a number of achievements when it comes to solar and LED lighting upgrades and also our innovation in asphalt production. We were early to move on the electrification of public transport something that other councils and state governments have failed to do. We are now well on the journey when it comes to food waste recycling. Notwithstanding the achievements, we have set ambitious targets for our years ahead. Let's not just talk. We have a detailed strategy. We have an implementation plan to get us there, and I'm very proud about it, as it's set out in this item. We have a team of dedicated energy and carbon experts in Council who advise our administration. And I would like to place on record my thanks for their work. I also commend Councillor Davis and the Lord Mayor for their strong and unwavering leadership in this space. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. 
Yep. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I wasn't going to speak on this item, but uh, listening to the, uh, Councillor Cunningham's uh, waxing lyrical of what this council is actually doing, I just wanted to bring up a couple of uh, items, uh, really coal-faced stuff. Um, and the first one was kitchen tidies. Now, these ki kitchen tidies have been around for uh, probably a few years, um, and we came across them uh, on, a, on, a, on a list of what was in, uh, in storage uh, for council, um, along with some other stuff as well. Anyway, so we grabbed uh, a few hundred to start with, and uh, we went through those. Uh, people came into the ward office, believe it or not, came into the ward office to pick up a kitchen tidy so that they could compost at home. Right, we 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 eventually the stock uh, de depleted. We couldn't get any more, and then we were told that uh, uh, there was some other kitchen tidies that were going to be ordered to replace those. Um, we couldn't. Uh, we kept checking. Uh, they didn't come through, and then we we started getting calls from people that actually received living in Brisbane. I believe it was living in Brisbane uh, edition, um, saying that you could pick up a kitchen tidy if you wanted to compost at home, but you have to go into the ward office. We contacted uh, store, the store, the stores, and uh, and they said we haven't got any, but they're on order. But it's going to cost you about five dollars forty for each one of those this time. So listen. I mean, that's a very practical thing that this council is supposedly doing, but isn't doing. And I, I wonder why that's the case, right? You say one thing, but you do another. The other one was worm farms, right? There was a, a, a good quantity of worm farms in, in the stores as well. And we ordered uh, 100, and uh, they, came out, they came in, and of course, they took up a lot of room. Uh, but I'll tell you what, the people, the, my residents, were up for them. They really were. All we had to do was to put something out, and, and every week, at least another 10 were being picked up, right? Because people are keen as mustard to compost, and of course, they, of course those worm farms also uh, give you some really great fertilizer as well. And uh, if one thing about people in my ward, they're great gardeners, and they, they really love those, but we can't, again, get any more. They're gone, and they're not going to be replaced, it looks like. So, you know, you talk about all this carbon neutral stuff, but when it comes to the coal face stuff, if you're doing it, you're not doing it well enough. But in a lot of cases, you're doing it, or you say you're going to do it, but you're not doing it at all. Uh, and uh, I just think that is just so disingenuous to the people in my ward that really were up for doing local composting and uh, we're going to get behind the program. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Davis, are you rising to your feet? Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, Chair. And uh, I rise to speak on item A of this ENC uh, information report. Uh, earlier uh, this month, Council submitted its annual report to Climate Active, uh, including our public disclosure statement, uh, our carbon inventory, and for the first time, uh, Council's emissions reduction strategy. Um, as the Chamber is aware, the Federal Government now requires carbon neutral certified organisation to, uh, organisations to adopt a minimum emissions uh, reduction target of 30 per cent over a 10 year period, and the strategy before us today is uh, part of that. Uh, Mr Chair, under this LNP administration, Council has become the largest carbon neutral organisation uh, in Australia. We are a huge organisation and we, have, and we do have a big carbon footprint. And that's why I'm very excited uh, that in this strategy we're bringing together all of the work we're doing across council, uh, the council programs, to reduce our emissions and to keep Brisbane clean, green and sustainable. And as we see in the strategy, most of our emissions come from construction, uh, from public transport uh, and waste management. Mr Chair, uh, these are our core businesses uh, and many of these emissions are currently unavoidable. We have to deliver a central public infrastructure, a public transport network and, of course, collect the rubbish. That's what our residents expect and that's what we deliver. And we're taking steps to do so in a practical and sustainable way. Unlike those opposite who think the solution to an output of almost 600,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide is to declare a climate emergency and slash red bin collection in half. 
But under the Schrinner administration, emissions reduction strategy, we will continue to deliver the basic and essential functions of local government in a clean and green way. Already we're purchasing 100 per cent Australian renewable energy to power our facilities and have grown our solar portfolio to more than 3.2 megawatts worth. The new Brisbane Metro Depot at Rochdale, uh, which I know Councillor Murphy, Murphy is working uh, very uh, hard to deliver, will be the biggest ever solar plant in Council's history. And once complete, the new Brisbane Metro Depot will reduce our carbon footprint by more than 1,600 tonnes each year, and that's the equivalent of taking about 550 cars off the road each year. And of course, the depot will service and power our new fleet of 60 zero tailpipe, emission, tailpipe emissions metro vehicles, and we're working towards an agreement with the state to phase out diesel buses in our 1,200 strong fleet. In waste management, we're embracing the exciting potential of landfill gas capture technology. At the Brisbane landfill in Rochdale, we're not only saving the atmosphere from harmful methane emissions, but we're generating enough green energy to power 17,000 homes. And in construction, just as one example, we're delivering the cleanest and greenest road resurf resurfacing program in Australia, recycling more than 200,000 tonnes of asphalt each year to deliver the Smoother Suburban Streets program. We're also leading the way in recycling and repurposing one of the most difficult materials plaguing landfill across the globe, with Councillor Marks leading our investment in innovative ways to recycle rubber to use to produce even more sustainable roads. Mr Chair, this strategy captures what the Schrinner Council is all about. Effective and practical climate action, not virtue signalling. It's our roadmap of achievable, real-world solutions towards a net zero council. And in fact, most of these are things that we're already doing, and it's working. Mr Chair, the progress we're making on reducing Council's carbon footprint last year, when we submitted our report to Climate Active, uh, Councillor Cassidy stood up and said our carbon footprint is getting bigger. Well, I'm pleased to say that he's wrong, Mr Chair, because this year's public disclosure statement, which clearly he hasn't read, continues to show a strong downward trend in our footprint, which has reduced by about 7 per cent since we first became carbon neutral. And given the progress that we've made so far and the accelerating advancement in technology we are embracing, I'm very, very confident that we will meet and beat our emissions reduction target by 2031 as we gear up to host the first ever carbon positive Olympic and Paralympic Games. Uh, Mr Chair, there are a number of things that were spoken about by uh, some councillors opposite, and I just want to restate a few things. Uh, and that is about what we achieve uh, and what we show in our uh, public disclosure statement to Climate Active. Again, Councillor Cassidy, uh, he sits in the chamber uh, and he declares that, in his opinion, uh, we aren't carbon neutral. And I would take the opinion of our carbon specialists in council ahead of Councillor Cassidy, because council does the responsible thing, Mr Chair, uh, and offsets its emissions with investment in carbon abatement projects around the world. And it, whilst it might be his opinion, Mr Chair, it's not the federal Labor government's opinion, uh, because they continue to certify Brisbane City Council as carbon neutral. Uh, the Lord Mayor has always said, and he restated it today, that tackling climate change is a global problem that requires a global response. What happens in China and what happens in India and anywhere in the world, it does affect us, uh, our climate and our way of life. And so it is not, uh, rather, it, it, why shouldn't we be investing in carbon offsets overseas, particularly in some of these developing nations with far worse footprints than our own? Uh, we may be a local order, government, chair. but we are a point local order, government. Chair. Point of order, Chair. Oh, point of order to you, Councillor. Will the Councillor take a quick question? Uh, Will you take a no. question? Councillor Davis, no. We are a local government, Mr Chair, with a global view. We don't uh, take the view that because it's outside of our patch, uh, we can't do anything about it. Uh, Mr Chair, I, I did watch the Four Corners uh, program uh, last night. Uh, and uh, the reports and claims that were made in uh, that episode, episode uh, were quite concerning, particularly for some of the local communities. But 
like in any market, there are some uh, participants out there that don't do the right thing. And, but this is exactly why council does not buy this type of offset. Council has had no dealings with the companies that were named uh, in that report, and I understand that in light of it, action has been taken against at least one of these road companies. Uh, what was also clear from the episode uh, is that offsetting emissions is the right thing to do, and that's why we do it. I can't speak to Climate Active's own processes, uh, but it is, the fed it, it is a federal federal market authority uh, and it's the one that is the most trustworthy source that we have today. Um, offsets that are purchased by council are subject to an incredibly rigorous scrutiny. We do everything in our power to interrogate the integrity of the offsets that we purchase. And these offsets uh, must be accredited by Climate Active, uh, which is again the federal body that's been established might I say by the Rudd, uh, Gillard Rudd Labor government as the national carbon offset standard. Climate Active only recognises two international offset projects accredited by two reputable standards, and that's the Verified Carbon Standard, uh, VCS, and the Gold Standard. And on top of this, uh, Council undertakes its own due diligence on carbon abatement projects that we invest in. We conduct our own research uh, into these projects and their operators. We don't purchase land-based offsets from overseas because we know that they uh, might be vulnerable and some of the risks that are highlighted in last night's Four Corners uh, program we are, uh, we are aware of and that's why we don't invest in them. Uh, in our evaluation process, we score projects with independently verified social, economic or environmental co-benefits or evidence of stakeholder engagement processes and environmental assessments uh, more highly than others. And because offsets are financial investments, uh, or rather in instruments, they are traded by corporate treasury uh, under Council's financial risk management <coughs> framework and we undertake the due diligence of all brokers that we process through. Uh, Mr Chair, uh, VERA is an organisation which accredits international offset projects uh, against the verified carbon standard and verified projects are then listed on the VERA registry. VERA doesn't run or manage projects and nor do we buy offsets from VERA. The federal government through Climate Active recognises the VCS as one of only two reputable international standards tradable in Australia. Council hasn't spent anything with VERA. Our investment goes towards the projects generating the offsets. Uh, Mr Chair, there are many organisations that use offset to claim uh, carbon neutrality, including uh, Melbourne, Sydney and uh, Adelaide City Council, as well as the Lord Mayor said, and other 11 local governments. It's also used by Labor's friends in the super industry, like CBUS and Care Super. And could you imagine, Mr Chair, the irony of Councillor Cassidy telling Planet Art, Australia's most trusted environmental not profit, that their climate credentials are bogus because yeah. they use VERA offsets too. Mr Ca Chair, Councillor we are proud of the Davis, work that we are doing in this time place. has expired. Thank you. Is there any further debate? No further debate? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Well, that's been an interesting discussion uh, and you know, really what it comes down to, if you really want to summarise what's been said, uh, it's an administration, a council here that's leading the way in Australia for local government when it comes to climate action. And then it's a group of people with their heads buried in the sand on the other side that can't get their head around the fact that an LNP administration could be leading the way. They just cannot, they cannot comprehend it. They cannot get their head around it when their own Labor colleagues all over the place aren't actually taking any real action. And so this really says it all. It really says it all. Um, Councillor Cassidy um, trying to portray me as some kind of conservative. Well, it's funny. Um, Quite a few people in my own party don't think that. <laughs> so, there's even been people trying to kick me out because I'm not a conservative enough. Um, but that's okay. I, I didn't join um, a conservative party. I joined the Liberal Party. I am a Liberal. And I know that Councillor Cassidy and his colleagues don't understand what a Liberal is, um, but a Liberal is about actually taking action to get things done. Uh, and it, it is about making sure, rather than um, 
rather than virtue signalling, we actually do something about it. Um, because in the end, um, outcomes are the important thing here. Um, and so we'll continue to progress uh, in getting the best uh, environmental outcomes, the best outcomes for our city. Uh, and I would also say that um, you know, Councillor Davis pointed out some other organisations um, whose reputation has been dis besmirched by uh, uh, opposition comments. Well, let me point out another couple of great organisations in the Brisbane community who aren't large organisations but are really taking real action. Corinda State High School is certified as carbon neutral in the Climate Active Program. I wonder if they're going to get attacked for having some kind of bogus accreditation. The Ashgrove West Kindy is carbon neutral under the Climate Active Program. Is that a bogus certification as well? Or, or is it just because it's an LNP administration that in my, I mean, you know, this, they are so transparent. They are so transparent in their, in their views. Uh, they are so transparent in their politics. Uh, we are transparent in our actions. Thank you. We now move to the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Strunk. Please ring the bells, eyes to the right, nose to the left. Thanks, Billy. Please close the bars. Clarks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being eight in favour, six against and one abstention. Thank you. Councillors, please resume your seats. <laughs> Councillor Davis, Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee. Decisions, please. Sorry, Mr Chair, I'm just getting my note. Oh, thank you. Mr Chair, I move that the report setting out the decisions uh, of the Establishment Coordination Committee as Delegate of Council during the summer recess 2022-23 on matters usually considered by the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee be noted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Davis and seconded by Councillor Mackay that the report setting out the decisions the Establishment and Coordination Committee as delegate of Council during the summer, summer recess 2022-23, matters usually considered by the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, be noted. Councillor Davis, is there any debate? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, we had a number of items considered during the recess. The first was item A was a park naming, which was the formal renaming of the park known as Father Jack Madden Place Park on the corner of Tathra Street and Webster Road, Stafford, as uh, Tathra Place Park. Uh, item B was also a park naming, which is the formal naming of the playground noted at Callaghan Park at 340 Zilmere Road, Zilmere, as Uncle Lewis Orchard Place, uh, who was a 
very well known and very well respected elder in the northern suburbs of Brisbane. Uh, item C uh, were three petitions requesting council support of pro a proposed memorial in Callumvale District Park in Callumvale. And I know Councillor Owen has been working very closely on this particular um, uh, memorial. And item D was a petition requesting that council remove or relocate the gazebo in the Avenue Park at Sunningbank Hills. Um, and I'll leave further debate to the chamber. Thank you. Is there any debate? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak on uh, item B, the park naming uh, at O'Callaghan Park. Sorry, the place naming at O'Callaghan Park. Uh, the new playground is Uncle Lewis Orchard Place. Uh, um, Uncle Lewis Orchard was one of the most powerful and passionate men I have met in my time as councillor. I got to know Uncle Lewis through his work at the Kubara Kindy, where he was a board member right up to the day he died. Throughout his life, Uncle Lewis committed a vast amount of time and effort across our community, working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. He worked for Dundalai House, Murray Watch, the Umpi Kurumba Corporation and the Aboriginal Legal Service, as well as Kubara Kindi. Uncle Lewis truly lived a life of service, and many in my community can, to it, can attest to the impact that he had on them. He was a fierce advocate, a compassionate elder, and a real friend to so many on the north side of Brisbane. After his passing in February last year, I was approached by his family about naming the soon-to-be-upgraded O'Callaghan Park playground in his honour. As a long-term Zulmia local and respected community elder, Uncle Lewis had a strong connection to O'Callaghan Park and the nearby Zulmia PCYC right next door, becoming a vital part of their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth justice program. It was at the Zulmia PCYC where Uncle Lewis and a busload of kids from his beloved Kubara Kindi as well as kids from other local schools sat in the hall to watch Kevin Rudd's national apology speech. He often referred to both this moment and the ceremony that took place a decade earlier where Labor Lord Mayor Jim Sawley welcomed Indigenous elders into City Hall and presented them with the keys to the city of Brisbane. Those were some of his political heroes, as he used to say. As I said in this chamber uh, about a year ago after his passing, Uncle Lewis uh, was one of my political heroes. Uh, to see his legacy and profound impact on our community all you have to do is look around the north side. After working through the necessary requirements with council and consulting other local organisations, I'm proud to see this park naming progress today. Uh, a special thanks to Susie Orchard for providing so much valuable and rich information about the life of Uncle Lewis and to local organisations like Kubara Kindi, Kabingai and Zilmir Community Centre for their support of this application. Thank you. Is there any further debate? No further debate. Councillor Davis. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Councillor Owen. I didn't see. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry Councillor Owen. Um, Mr. Chair, it gives me great pleasure to speak tonight on item C, and particularly this is a very important local addition to not only our community as a local memorial, but also it is of significance for our city of Brisbane and for those who have served our nation in times of conflict and in peace and have put themselves on the front line for the democracy that we have the privilege of bearing the benefits of today. So um, there can never be enough said for the sacrifice that has been made by so many who have gone before us. And I would just like to say to my local veterans who are working with me on this project, an absolute debt of gratitude is owed to all of you for your feedback, your interest and your contribution to this memorial and the process that we have been undertaking. In fact, at four o'clock this Thursday afternoon, we will be meeting once again to start the preparations for Anzac Day and through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Davis, I would like to say it's great to know that we will actually be breaking ground within the next week and a half and it is something that the veterans are certainly looking forward to. For many of my residents, they've had to either go up to Sunnybank or down to Greenbank, which is actually in Logan, and they asked me a number of years ago, can we have our very own memorial. So there has been a process that our local community has certainly undertaken 
and there is significant support for this memorial. So I am very, very pleased that it will be actually constructed in Callumvale District Park. The funding for the memorial has been provided through my Lord Mayor's Community Fund for Callumvale Ward. And I think that this is a really appropriate recognition of the service of all of our local veterans, our men and women who have served our nation in uniform over the many years and continue to do so. And in closing, Mr Chair, I would just like to say all who have served, thank you for your service. No further debate. Councillor Davis, no right or reply. Okay, we now move to the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any petitions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. I have a petition um, for Aspley and also one for Stafford. Thank you. Any further petitions? No further petitions? Can I have a motion for receipt of the petition, please? After, oh, sorry, Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Second. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Strunk that all, the, the petition as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, general business. Uh, councillors, are there any statements required as a result of an Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? No. Are there any matters of general business? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak about a few achievements from the Marchant Ward um, over the recess. We've seen the opening or oh, the t switching on of the lights at Kirby and Ellison Road upgrade. This has been a long anticipated upgrade for the residents of Aspley and a very welcome. We've had so many thank yous because now it's safer for people to cross, especially if you're going to the Guide Hut or to our wonderful Marchant Park. Um, it's been a real welcome to the local area. We've also the new toilets for Frederick and Ann Park are finally open. Thank you very much to um, Councillor Davis' team. And Bradbury Park, everyone. Bradbury Park just keeps on getting better. Um, I can't wait for the anticipated opening um, in the next few months. Now, something a little bit, a little bit embarrassing, but I'm going to share um, for you. Um, Marchant Park Warehouse Cricket had a cricket tournament over the weekend, oh, over last week, for blind bowls and all inclusive bowls, which was a great achievement. And I must thank Australia Cricket, um, Warehouse Cricket, for putting this event on. However, as a youngster, I was a cricket tragic. Kepler Vessels was my hero. I have been waiting to meet Kepler Vessels. For those youngsters who or in the team who don't know who he is, or not a cricket tragic, he played for Brisbane, he played for Australia, um, he's the first international cricketer who has made 100 runs for two different countries. He was also the captain of South, South Africa in 94, which I had the great privilege of sitting in Newlands, watching that test, supporting Alan Border, but of course supporting my Kepler. Now my daughter, this is what a tragic I was, was going to be called Kepler if she was a boy. However, Kepler King did not work too well at that stage. Kepler Vessels, I must thank you for your passion in sport, not only for cricket, uh, but also your training of boxing and everything else. But I also have to apologise for the very embarrassing meeting of the local councillor. <laughs> I was a big groupie. I had to apologise. I just kept on speaking without thinking. The foot was in the mouth, but he was very gracious and did laugh. So again, thank you so much to Australia Cricket for putting this wonderful event on. Um, I'm happy to say Marchant Ward will be hosting. I'm not going to give too much information, but I know the Deputy Mayor is going to be a batter. Um, an event on the 18th of um, September this year, where we have, we're going to be including uh, uh, blind cricket as part of this. 
We are going to have the Marchant 11 play at Gibson Park against Stafford District Cricket to raise awareness for cricket. I can't wait to expose my team, but it's a big secret now. Already said one. <laughs> The Deputy Mayor, I'm a bowler, so let's see how we go. Um, and to finish it off, after, after the main game with the All Abilities Cricket. So I'd like to thank again District Cricket for being um, a part of this. And yes, I may have to write a letter to Kepler Vessels and see at the great all-rounder to see if he'll join our team. Thank you. Any further general business? Councillor Sri Ranganathan. Thanks, Chair. Rise to speak on a couple of things. Bus routes, green space, uh, zoning issues. Just first off, I'd like to thank Councillor Murphy and the transport team for their great work on the new 86 bus route. It's um, really exciting for the GAB Award to have our first free bus service uh, as ever, as far as I'm aware. And I want to sincerely thank and congratulate the Mayor and the Chair of Transport and the entire team for pulling that service together. I think it's a real uh, asset to the community. I'm already hearing a lot of positive feedback from residents and um, seeing that the usage numbers are slowly increasing. So I hope that the Mayor will be alert to the fact that that is proving to be a very popular service already and that um, it won't just be a one-year trial, that we'll be able to keep that service operating long term. It's filling an important need in terms of connecting different parts of West End and South Brisbane. Uh, I also did just want to highlight that it would be great if that service started a bit earlier. Lord Mayor, as you might be aware, currently the service, service runs from 10am until 11pm, uh, and it's great to have a service that runs until 11pm seven days a week. I appreciate that a lot of services don't run that late or on weekends. Um, but we do have 30,000 people uh, in, in West End and South Brisbane, so it's serving a big catchment. But, uh, the point is, Lord Mayor, it's pro it would be ideal if that service could start a little bit earlier. 10 a.m. is good, but 8 a.m. would be a lot better. I understand one of the main reasons that the initial timetable didn't start a bit earlier was that it's been hard to secure enough bus drivers for the morning peak periods in Brisbane at the moment. And I expect that, that I, I accept that that's a genuine challenge, but I hope through you, Chair, Lord Mayor, that as um, the availability of bus drivers increases, we'll look to uh, put those services on for the morning peak as well. Uh, secondly, I, I just wanted to note that we, we had a recent announcement in the Mayor's newsletter about a dog off leash area for South Brisbane. Uh, and I've been talking for some time about the need for a dog off leash area and I wanted to thank Councillor Davis for hearing, hearing that need and um, doing her best within the constraints that are, are available to us. But I, I think the, the location to be blunt, it's, it's better than nothing, but it's suboptimal. And what it really highlights is that we do still need new parkland somewhere in the centre of West End. And the dominant strategy from the LNP at the moment seems to be that we'll wait until the Olympics, and then after the Olympics, we'll secure some of that river, riverside land along Parmalat. And I want to say very clearly to Councillor Davis and to the Lord Mayor that we can't wait until the early 2030s to get new parkland for the 4101 postcode. I've said it here before about West End's population has increased from about 8,000 to 16,000 in the last couple of years, and South Brisbane's population has increased from about 6,000 to 14,000. So we've had an increase of something like 20,000 people in the 4101 postcode, and no significant increase in parkland. So Lord Mayor, I, I know you can't magically create parkland overnight, but I, I want to emphasise to you that you're going to have to create new parkland before the Olympics and before that riverside industrial land that's set aside for the media centre, et cetera, becomes available. So we do need to create new parkland somewhere in the 4101 postcode. And I know that in the local government infrastructure plan, there is a new park identified in the LGIP, but the council officers, I think, haven't been given the support they need from the administration to identify and secure um, sites within the LGIP defined area. So there's a, there's a park there. It's been a commitment of the administration for some time that the park would be delivered, but you haven't done it. And so that's a growing concern. And it, it makes it really hard to find space for dog off leash areas. It also makes it hard to find space for a skate park. I've been going on about a skate park for some time now, and we still don't have a skate park in the, in the 4101 postcode. It's a very young community. It's a community that really values those kinds of recreational activities. Uh, and all we've got is a tiny little um, 
pin drop of a, a bowl over in Kangaroo Point that's not really accessible for West Enders anyway. So um, uh, I, I really would like to see this administration take that need for a new skate park facility in the inner south side seriously. Finally, just on um, planning matters, I wrote to Councillor Allen quite some time ago about the what kinds of land uses and um, activities were permitted on industrial sites. And I, Councillor Allen, through you, Chair, I don't think I ever did receive a proper response to that. I'm sure it's coming, but it's been several months now. Um, uh, the issue is essentially that there are many kinds of activities that have operated in warehouses for many years now. Um, and I think particularly of live music concerts, uh, dance studios, art workshops, etc. Et these are essentially industrial activities in that they are industries which can generate a lot of noise and often require a lot of space. But the standard interpretations of Council's city plan don't ordinarily permit those kinds of activities in uh, industrial sites. And I think that needs to change. I think we're long overdue for a change on, in that respect. Uh, and it wouldn't be that hard for the council to do it. It doesn't necessarily need to create new use codes. It just needs to allow uses like theatre use um, in the industrial zone in, uh, in the industrial zones of city plan. So it's not a not a change that should take a great deal of extra administrative work. But I, I think the core point here is that these uses are already happening. For decades, musicians and artists and dancers have been using warehouses and industrial sites for dance classes, for um, even, yeah, for concerts, for recording studios, etc. And unfortunately, this administration, I think, has, has been a little too slow at um, recognising and formalising those uses. So it's, it's not that I'm asking for something new to happen or a change in how industrial land or industrial sites are currently used. I'm simply saying let's recognise the long running uses of these, these sites for artistic activities uh, and, and make the necessary changes in city plan to support that. The same probably goes for gym activities. I've had a conversation re recently with someone from one of the, the doggy daycare services. Um, currently there's nowhere for... Um, daycare for dogs to, to operate in the city. It's not allowed on residential zone land. It's not, not allowed on um, retail sites. A lot of those doggy daycare facilities have been set up in uh, industrial sites and warehouses, but they are also technically aren't allowed there. I believe in Councillor Cunningham's ward, uh, possibly one was shut down recently, or there, there, was an, um, there was a place operating in Cooparoo and Basically, they had to let staff go and close down the business because the council said that that particular use w didn't comply with city plan. Um, and to you, Councillor Johnson, I don't think the problem is that they need a DA. I, I think the problem is that it's not a defined use. So they don't actually know, the council officers don't actually know how to class or ca categorise it. So, yeah, it's, yeah, the, the, um, the experience has been that it's been quite hard to get DAs for, for some sites. And anyway, the, the broader point is just that we, we do need that reform of industrial land zoning. And um, Councillor Allen, I've been waiting quite a while just for a reply to my email to at least let me know whether you support those suggestions or, or whether the administration is headed in a very different direction. Um, and one of the requests in that email was to at least uh, give some guidance to the compliance and enforcement teams that change is coming so that they don't need to be too aggressive about shutting down recording studios and dance studios and, and small theatres that are currently operating in those warehouse spaces. Because at the moment, if they get one single noise complaint, they'll go out to the industrial precinct and find wherever that dance studio is operating and issue them um, show cause notices and tell them that they need to spend tens of thousands of dollars on DAs, etc., etc., in order to operate which is um, not viable for a smaller business that's just a, a short-term tenant. So this is becoming a really big issue across the city. I've, I've heard from now dozens of different businesses and artists and um, community groups that are trying to operate sustainably in these sites. And um, yeah, fitness groups as well. There's a really wide range of activities that are quite appropriate for those industrial areas because they, they need to make a bit of noise and because they need a lot of space. And, um, given that the, the sorts of activities that those industrial sites were once used for probably aren't as commercially viable in Australia these days, um, at least not in the inner city, 
that it's time to make those changes and I, I hope it doesn't take too much longer. Uh, finally, I just wanted to make a really quick point that the, the public demand for more green space in new developments is still growing. I, I regularly get complaints from residents that there's not, enough, there's not enough trees or greenery within the new development projects, both high density apartments but also suburban subdivisions. And I don't think the council's deep planting changes recently go far enough. I think we need to be requiring um, firmer deep planting minimums on suburban and, and detached dwelling developments. Um, and we also need to be increasing those deep planting minimums for high density apartments. So hopefully the administration hears the community on that and starts to take a bit more notice. Thanks. Thank you. Any further speakers in general business? Councillor Johnston. Yes, earlier today I uh, said in the motion of condolence with respect to uh, the earthquake in Turkey and Syria that uh, I suspected that the Lord Mayor had spent more on his overseas trip to um, the US than he was spending on earthquake relief. Um, I've now caught up with some ENC papers and I can see that the Lord Mayor and his staff member, the cost was $21,000. Uh, which was slightly under the amount that he's given for earthquake relief in uh, Turkey. But then I noticed that the environment chair is going on a junker to Japan as well, so that's 10 grand. So $31,000 for LMP, councillors and staff to go on overseas junkets, and $25,000 for earthquake victims in Syria and Turkey. I just thought it should be on the public record um, that the Lord Mayor thinks that overseas junkets for himself and his mates is more important than helping uh, uh, poorer countries uh, recover from one of the most horrific natural disasters in the world. And I didn't even have the facts and figures and I was pretty much on the money. I think it's disgusting. Further general business? Declare the meeting. Oh, sorry, Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Chair. Um, I rise to speak just very briefly, if I can, about the 19 days of handstand challenge. Nearly three years ago, Hannah Clark, Aaliyah, Layana and Trey were murdered at Camp Hill, and it's been a long three years for her parents, Sue and Lloyd. Every day they've worked to create awareness about coercive control and bring about change. Mr Chair, they've achieved remarkable progress, even bringing about that legislative change and they've also been named Queensland's Australians of the Year. They're also making progress towards completing Hannah's Sanctuary, and this is a place for women and children to begin rebuilding their lives after leaving a DV perpetrator. It's been a really difficult journey for them. Amongst all the grief and the overwhelming sadness, Sue and Lloyd still find moments of happiness when they remember Hannah and her children. Sue and Lloyd also want Hannah to be remembered for all the fun and the loving stuff that they did together, and that happened to be handstands. So that's what's behind the 19 Days of Handstands campaign. I have to admit, and you probably know that I'm terrible at handstands, but I'm giving it a go to show my support for her family and to show support for thousands of other victims who suffer just like Hannah did. I want to um, say thank you to my colleagues, um, both here in the chamber and abroad, uh, who have jumped on and got involved in the handstand challenge, especially as well to my local uh, state MP who gave it a go yesterday. You can join in on social media too. Please uh, make sure that you uh, tag Small Steps for Hannah and hashtag 19 Days of Handstands. Thank you. Thank you. For the general business, Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just rise to take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy belated uh, Lunar New Year. Um, this year, the Lunar New Year um, actually is, was a bit earlier. Normally, Lunar New Year falls in the month of February, but this year it was fell, uh, fell on um, 22nd of January. And uh, of course, uh, it is uh, one of the most significant um, celebrations in Asian culture. But there's a bit of variance. In, uh, in every other country, we celebrate the Year of the Rabbit, whereas in Vietnam, they celebrated the uh, Year of the Cat. So I, I did a bit of research. Uh, uh, there were a few myths or stories. And one of them was that uh, there was no rabbit in Vietnam. That's why they replaced rabbit with cat. I'm not sure how uh, accurate that is. But anyway, I, I'm sure everyone enjoyed the uh, festivities and celebrations of the Lunar New Year. And uh, of course, 
there, there were lots of events celebrated, and uh, I'm sure um, probably all of you have been to some kind of a Lunar New Year celebration. But I'd like to uh, thank the Lome for hosting a civic reception in uh, City Hall here. Uh, it's uh, widely welcomed and liked by the multicultural communities because normally um, the state parliament and also uh, Brisbane City Council celebrates with a civic, uh, well, with a reception. But this year, apparently the Premier went on holiday and forgot to book the date. So uh, there was only a celebration hosted by Brisbane City Council by the Lord Mayor Adrian Srinath. So I think, you know, that's, that shows how, how we care about the multicultural communities. And uh, of course, uh, talk of the Lunar New Year, I, I, I have to say uh, the Year of the Rabbit is a symbol of longevity, peace and prosperity. And uh, of course, according to Lo Mayor, in, in his word, it is also about multiplying. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so hopefully everyone multiply in their wealth and health. Wow. So wow. yes, yeah, but you know, it, it can be applied to more things. But, and also 2020, 2023 has been predicted to be a year of hope. So I'm sure um, Brisbane City Council, under the leadership of the law, of law Mayor Adrian Trina, that will make sure that it is a year of hope for everyone in Brisbane. Thank you. Yeah. For the general business, Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I rise to speak on some local events and also some very important um, people in my ward. Um, can I say to Councillor Huang and to all of the people celebrating the Lunar New Year, Xinyan Kwai Lergong Shi Fa Tai Chuk Mun Nun Nam Moi. So um, it is just my privilege to be able to go and celebrate at the many different functions right across um, the city with these people when they are ce celebrating the Lunar New Year because it is an important part in their calendar. And to all of the Punjabis who celebrated last month, Lori. Um, it's been a few years since I was in India and celebrated Lori over there, but um, I know it is a very special time and there, there are many Punjabis who live in my ward, so I do extend that greeting to them for Lori. Um, Mr Chair, the weekend was um, very sad in a number of respects because uh, there was the memorial service for the fall of Singapore at Anzac Square, which I attended and laid a wreath, but also I attended the memorial service for the earthquake victims for Turkey and Syria. And to join with those people in the local community who have lost loved ones, they are very, very devastated. It is. It is incomprehensible the amount of lives that have been lost so quickly and to talk to people who had literally been in some of the same buildings that have collapsed into rubble a week prior to that earthquake, they, they are going through such feelings of emotional, they, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster for them. So whatever we can do to support them, as I said to them on, um, on the weekend, that. We, as the city of Brisbane, when people choose to come and live in our city, they become part of our Brisbane family. And just as they are impacted, we are here to support them. Similarly, today, uh, many people may have seen that there are extreme um, fires waging out on the Western Downs. And to our many volunteer rural firefighters who trekked out from um, our surrounds at, at about 4am this morning. Um, please stay safe um, and thank you for what you're doing. I would like to actually speak about um, some very special young people in my community and that is my school leaders. Today I had 60 students here in City Hall who are school leaders in our local community and they are such inspirations. They, they really step up to the mark and it was wonderful to have them here, particularly about a dozen students from the Callumvale Special School because the obstacles that many of those students have overcome are significant but it was my privilege to welcome them here on behalf of Brisbane City Council and to 
embrace them all here as leaders, not only of their schools, but for our city. And I think that in the hands of these young people, our city is going to be in great stewardship in years to come. It was so wonderful to see how they interacted with each other, liaised with each other, and they have started that communication process, school to school, school to council, and now they're looking for other ways that they can help fundraise for those earthquake victims. So I think that that's really, really important and it's a great outcome. And I just think that they have great leaders in their school, in their school principals and their teachers, and I really appreciate the fact that they all came in here today. I would also just like to um, convey to the chamber that there is a very, very special young lady who lives in my ward. I've known her for a number of years, and she is going to be flying out to London on Sunday because on the Tuesday the 20th of December, she auditioned for the Royal Ballet School in London. Now, over 1,400, <coughs> 1,400 ballerinas from right across Australia, um, oh, sorry, around the world, danced to go and receive an <coughs> invite to London. And Emily Buckley of, in, from Callum Vale Ward will be going to London for the final audi um, auditions for the London Ballet School. So I just think that this is just an amazing achievement. Um, in the last 12 months, and I want to make sure I get this right, um, so Emily has performed at QPAC in January um, last year in the Queensland Ballet's double bill of Swan Lake and the Graduation Ball. She also, um, last March, competed in her very first Royal Academy of Dance Jacqueline Moreland Awards and was awarded the winner of the intermediate foundation level. And in April, she headed off to Melbourne and trained at the Australian Ballet School for a week as part of the interstate training program. In May, she was awarded the Jodie White Bavona Scholarship with Ballet Theatre Queensland. And in September, the Australian Ballet School offered her invitee status for 2023. So in December, she had a very, very successful audition with the Royal Ballet School London and has been invited to that final audition round. Um, and she will be departing this Sunday for London. And I would just like this opportunity on behalf of the City of Brisbane to say to Emily Buckley, we are very proud of your achievement. We are very proud of your dedication and hard work and we wish you well in London. Thank you, Mr Chair. Councillor, who was first? Councillor Strunk, because I want Strunk. to finish on a high note. Okay, <laughs> Councillor Strunk. <laughs> okay, that's a bit of a challenge. <laughs> Uh, well, Chuk Mung Namoy, um, <laughs> Happy New Year, um, and uh, I just want to say uh, that the Lunar New Year celebrations this year were um, probably better than any other year I can remember uh, since coming to uh, work for a state government uh, member uh, back in 2001. And that's saying a lot actually, but uh, I think because of the COVID years, I think people were really up for a big party. And so we, uh, we started off with the Tet Festival, at least in my ward anyways. Uh, and I thought Friday night was big, but Saturday was just, there was cars everywhere. Uh, and uh, people were just out to have a great time. Uh, and, uh, and they did for two days in a row. So I don't know how, what, how many thousands of, of participants there were for those two days. But then on that Saturday, I, I, uh, I went, I couldn't even get a car park, I had to go away. <laughs> And I had a stall there too, because there was just no parking. Anyway, so I went, I went away, but I, my stall uh, operated with my, my team. Thank goodness that they got, went there early and got a car park. Uh, anyway, so I went away, and uh, as I was driving home, I went past uh, a couple of other, uh, a, another huge event uh, by the Catholic Church celebrating the, the Lunar Festival as well in their, uh, uh, in their premises at Lilac Street. Um, and uh, it was just massive. And then uh, I was told that, of course, the Buddhist temple in Freeman Road had another huge one 
and uh, and then then I, then of course I attended uh, about a week later uh, another temple, um, which I thought was like a small <laughs> a small congregation of, uh, of 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 people that occupy this uh, this temple, but I was wrong. There was it was almost equal to the Freeman Road, so I'm told. So it was it was a year that uh, I'll always remember in regards to the uh, Lunar New Year and. Um, and I, but I just want to pick up on a comment, uh, and I hope this is not a bit of a downer there, uh, uh, Councillor Howard, but I just want to make a comment in regards to uh, Councillor Hong when he indicated that the Premier was away on a holiday and wasn't able to, uh, uh, to attend the Brisbane uh, celebration. And uh, I can assure him that uh, that's probably the only year I've ever seen her go away at that time of the year. And I worked for her for 10 years. And, uh, and then, of course, I've been a councillor for seven, so I, I have a pretty good uh, idea of, uh, of where she travels and when she travels. And, uh, and that was, the first, as I say, the first year I can remember that she wasn't able to, uh, other than the COVID years, uh, attend a, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the Tet Festival or Tet Celebrations, which we did have some in the COVID years. So I just want to put that, put that on the record that uh, um, you know, we all deserve a holiday when we can take a holiday, and uh, obviously this year was uh, at that uh, at that uh, Lunar New Year time. So, anyways, I just wanted to put that on the record. And but uh, yeah, it was a great uh, great celebration this year. And uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank through you. I'd like to thank Councillor Strunk for his comments as well. But I'm going to talk about the Brisbane Greeters because today is their 11th birthday. And I promised them faithfully that I would say something about them in the chamber. So um, we all know what a fantastic job those Brisbane greeters do. Um, and we really want to thank them for their ongoing commitment to sharing our city's sites and stories. And visitors and locals alike uh, just love the work that they do. Um, so they showcase our city and they share the untold stories that only locals would know, like the elephant buried under Suncorp Stadium. Did you know that? Um, or that the first Bulimba ferry was actually a rowboat. Um, now, <laughs> I'm not sure about all of that, but they've, they've assured me they've checked all of the facts. And not only have they shared Brisbane history, but they're now delivering a new tour, the 21st century Brisbane. So um, I really want to thank them very, very much for all of the work they do. And I promise faithfully that I would read a poem that one of the greeters, Gail Machoka, has written for the 2023 birthday. So here it is. Well, here we are again, another year older. Lucky for us, we greeters are getting bolder. We can tackle almost anything that this city's handed us. We always find our way to town. We walk, take the cat, train or bus. We showcase our city to those who come with smiles on our faces. We welcome everyone. When we get together, we swap facts and stories that keep making our greeting more and more glorious. So greet us, let's kick up our heels and have a good time. Here's cheers to another year. It's going to be just divine. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday, Brisbane greeters. Yeah. Is there any other further general business? No one rising to their feet. I haven't missed anyone. I declare the meeting closed. <laughs> <laughs>